team devoted to the media capture task force meeting that had a, just a short update from the discussions we had before lunch. And before, even before that, we have a short interrupt from the RTC web group, which wishes to have a short item on the agenda. Here we go. Thank you. So, Magnus, we wanted to thank you for chairing this crazy group and all the time you've done on it. And we decided to get you a bottle of scotch because we know you like those. And once I asked you what type of scotch I could get you that you didn't already have, and I think you told me good luck with that, basically. <laughs> so I took that as a challenge, and I am pretty sure I have a scotch you don't have. We believe it's three years old, not as old as the working group, in fact. <laughs> um, it's, um, it's a blend, yes, yes, as many things are in this working group. <laughs> um, and we're pretty sure, like most of the things in the working group, it doesn't really taste very good. But <laughs> we decided that really this working group on any topic worth talking about, there should be two options, you know, the nine <laughs> option, the 264 option, and we should have a vote in between them. <laughs> but since the ITF doesn't vote, thank you very much for your work. Thank you. I was uh, drinking a three-year-old whiskey the, the other day. After having tasted it, the suggestion from the party was that we should bury it in the, in the garden and take it out 10 years later. <laughs> well, <laughs> so you have plenty of options. And thank you. Thanks a lot for your service. Now. Back to our second level interruption. Peter, would you want, to, would you like to, to take us through the slides you prepared for um, this, uh, for trying to come up with what we actually agreed to before the lunch? Okay, so we took the feedback from the last discussion, which are on the slides. Oh, okay, there we go. So the feedback that I wrote down was remove required is good. Use exact instead of value for when you want it required with a single value. Uh, min and max are always required. Uh, bare number means ideal, require wrapping for anything strict, and ignore what ideal means for now. So that's what I roughly put up there as the five changes. We remove required true, min, max, and exact all are required things. Ideal means not required. That's how you say something's not required. And a bare minimum, a bare number means ideal. But we're ignoring otherwise what ideal means. Yeah. So the next on slide. To say, is, this is changes beyond the baseline consensus, not changes to baseline consensus. Right. right? On so we're top not of. on top of. All right. right. Sorry. We're not modifying the baseline consensus. Be very clear. Okay. We're moving a level up. Changes on top of. Okay. So the next slide is probably easier to read, which is a diff. Okay, you have to squint a little at. Um, so before we had all these requireds, required, 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 required. Now we don't have those. Instead, if you want, uh, if you have a min and a max, it's just implicit. If you have something where it's a specific value, like aspect ratio, you wouldn't say min, that value, max, that value, required true. You would just say exact. Same for uh, an enumerated value instead of a numerical value, like facing mode. Instead of having to say value environment required true, you say exact environment. But if you have a bare number, such as frame rate here, then it's, this, it's not required. It's in ideal or optional by default. Oh, 
not actually that happy. Um, can you scroll oh, back? back and tell us why then? So, as I understand it, other things are required that are required, require the word required, right? It's just been a mass that don't require the word required? No, it, the word required doesn't exist anymore in the proposal. So how do I say it must, so, okay, so, so exact is how I say required? Like facing mode, I have to say exact? That's one way. For enumerated values. For, if you have a min and max, you don't need to, it's important. I, 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 why? I mean, the, 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 whole, the whole notion here was, the whole notion here allegedly was that these were, that these were expressing opinions. And now you tell me I can't express a min and max opinion, I have to express a min and max require, hard requirement. No, no, like I, I'd like my min and max between x and y, and and now you're telling me I can't, that I can't have an optional thing. I only I can only have a, a requirement. Uh, so if if you if you have a desire to have something between x and y, but not a hard requirement, you are most welcome to use ad advanced for that. That's how you do that. I mean, I, I'm not sure that I understand why you would want to do that rather than just stipulating the one number, but. Unless you want to go totals all the way down, we can like nest in the, in so, the okay, exact. So, so this min max ideal thing, so so this min max ideal thing, however, means that's actually a hard requirement. So yes, that's a hard requirement that says it, it must be 320, at least 320, no more than 1920, but I'd really like 1280. Was there something commission here to make this as baffling as possible? Uh -huh. I, I, this is the least baffling thing I've seen so far. Yeah, I mean, it, it, but another question just about how this differs from what's there now. In the existing proposal, you have mandatory constraints and then the other top level constraints, i.e. the ones that aren't in advance, are called unordered constraints. And first you apply the mandatory, then everything in advance, and then the unordered at the end because they're somewhat non-deterministic. Now, Look at that first one, with min, max, ideal. Min and max are mandatory, but ideal is optional. Does that apply before or after the um, advanced constraints? So none of, none of this is changing in the algorithm. Oh, so it's after? This is just. OK, I just wanted to make sure. A really a syntactical change. OK, that, I just wanted to check. Uh, it just, just seems like there's like a number of ways to say things and that, that are not at all that are all that are not explicit, not obvious, and like every time people screw this, I feel like they're making this more confusing. Um, and by the way, like the fact that you're saying exact for a number which is not even exact is like so offensive that like I can't even get into it. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I had the same reaction to exact on a floating point number. Yes. <laughs> I mean, we we could call it specific. It, it, it's a, a naming issue at that point. I mean. So to clarify, uh, exact means min and max is the same. It's like the same as specifying min and max for the same. Yeah, value. I mean, I could have put min and max over there without required. If if we wanted to, because we don't want exact with a floating point, we could require that we could say exact only applies to enumerated values, and then if you want, you can put min and max over there. Right. I was just going to say that it, in the case of numerical values. It means min and max right. are the same. We, we could remove that part of it. Like maybe I want to step too far in the uh, readability. But I guess the, the question. Well, that's what the discussion we had before, which is if you have a bare number, is it required or not? And everybody said they wanted it not, even though. Almost everybody. I mean, just to be, I mean, the whole idea of a frame rate being like exact, it, it, given that it fluctuates based on uh, lighting conditions, then like it could be like 29.97 instead of 30. Uh, I, I feel like nobody in their right mind would do that. Well, I, I understand that, but like, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, yeah, I, 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 I agree with that, but like, what, what, what's frustrating is we have we have two different we have two different things. In one case we have in one case we have a, we have a bare number that has no range, and that's a hint. And in another case we have two bare numbers that are max and a min, and those are hard. And that like like 
uh, like that just seems like like a recipe for confusion to have to have have to have two pieces of implicit syntax, one of which means hard and one of which means soft. Uh, well, I, I, ideal can't, I think, be anything other than soft. So, okay, so, so just a minute here. I, I think that what your complaint is, Ecker, if I can paraphrase, right, is most of this is fine, but the frame rate colon nothing, just a number straight after it, that, that the issue is what that means, right? We, we could not allow that at all. We could say you couldn't do that. But I think what a lot of people thought was the really simple, easy case that should be easy for people to do is you're going width 640, height 480, meaning I'd sort of like those, but if you can't do it, give me something else, right? That that was, that you, you know, and so that I think that that's why we went for ideal on, you know, that's the meaning of ideal. I mean, we could get rid of the ability to do the bare number thing, but I, I think most people want it. What I'm objecting to is, not having is, is either the fault case or there ought to be hard or ought to be soft. And there ought to be a keyword that tells you which one there is. And it should not be the case, but I have to know that ranges are hard and numbers are soft. That's what I don't like. So look, the idea that min and max are hard seems just fine with me. I think most programmers will figure that out. And that ideal is soft. I, that all seems very logical, right? Agree? Not agree. No, I do not want different semantics for ranges and, and bare values. I, I didn't say the word bare value. I'm talking about min, ideal, max, right? Now, one axis is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I don't care whether the fault is hard or the fault is soft. What I want you to have to communicate by keyword is one or the other, and they're not the fault. So I'd be fine with having min and max statements, min and max statements say, say, say it's required. I'd be fine with having. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be fine having the fault be hard, and be fine having the fault be soft. And you can make some argument about that, that you have an intuition that one of these values is, is naturally hard and one of these values is naturally soft. But I, I do not agree those intuitions intuition compose. So sacrifice one. I'll send a proposal to the list. That's where we got on. I mean, we've been going around and around on this for we spent eight hours on it in the last you know, two days practically. I mean, I don't. Wait, wait, wait. You are actually telling me. You, you, Cullen, are actually telling me, oh, like, we, you, we, we just, I can't, even, I can't even repeat it. Like, we went off and we, put, and we, and we produced something and now take it or leave it or present a proposal? No, no. I'm saying that if we want to make a decision here, what do you want us to do? Propose a change. Okay. I, I didn't understand it. You want to try again? As I said, either, either label, either. Not, not either. Just tell me what you want to do. No, I don't care. I said either I said I said either label things that are hard hard or label things that are soft soft. I don't care which one it is. Okay, so, so if we put min as hard underscore min and ideal is soft underscore ideal, I mean, what, what do you mean? What I mean is that either you, as I say, you have you have you have you have this label exact, right? Yeah, that might be the name of this. I, I don't care thing, if it's exact but, yeah, or But what to say whatever. exact means hard. What I'm saying is that you have you have here two cases. You have a min and a max uh, case under width and height, and you have a, and you have this bare frame rate thing. Those are both bare. Neither is neither is neither is attributed with either hard or soft. I'm saying take take decide hard as a default, and then add soft to frame rate, or decide decide soft as default and add hard to width. I don't care which. Well, uh, I, I agree with Ecker that. Uh, having a uh, hard be the default is semantically simpler because then you don't need exact. You need the opposite of that, which is ideal, which we already have. So it's one less thing. And so uh, that is more logical and uh, more intuitive. Uh, on the other end, it, there are use cases. Uh, you know, if you go what's more useful, it's the other one that, that uh, it's ideal by default. Let me just make sure I'm clarifying just for everyone. I understand what Ecker's proposed change here is, which is where we have frame rate colon 30, that would not be ideal. That would mean exact. A bare thing would be exact. Right? And now every the default is everything is hard. So the RMB would be that we add exact dash min and exact dash max or something like that. Or a or a hard colon true attribute to those. So I'm all right, guys, okay, so I'm gonna jump in now because I've been wanting to, to speak to this before we make a decision on it, right? Which is that um, Martin actually said something earlier that I think was a, a very simple description of how this works, right? Which is that 
when it's in a structure, except for the word ideal, when it's in a structure, it's hard. And when it's not in a structure, it's soft. That's actually how this works. You don't actually need a keyword. You can actually tell which it is by whether it's inside an object structure or not. Well, you have to know That's something almost, about a spec. To, I mean, about a, about a language to write any of it, right? So it's almost what he said. He said that uh, wrapping was required for anything strict. He didn't say it was sufficient to indicate it was. Strict. This is Adam. Does this mean that I can have but main that and then an object exact in a value? I don't. Then we start nesting objects in another level as well. I don't like that. Huh? I mean, you said when it's in a. Okay, but. I it's good, but unfortunately, since since this is not a valid aspect ratio, I want it to be with height. And now we're back. With, and now we're back to a problem. Okay. It's just it's just an artifact that you've decided that no that no possible value, which is which is hard, can be which can, can be expressed can be expressed as, it was ideal can be expressed expressed as a struct. Like I'm losing the plot here. The, 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 this 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 distinction between things that are in structs and things that are not is like completely synthetic. There's no, no, no ontological force. I mean, the, the, the naked va values are just shorthands. I mean, it's a way of saying, you know, ideal x, you know, is a shorthand for that. It's all it is. Ideals can never be hard, and everything else, you know, it, it, everything's mandatory by default, except for ideals, which obviously can't be, you know, mandatory. And the naked values are shorthands for ideal. But, but that's only, as I say, it's only because it's only because it's only because this is such an incredibly restricted language that, and then and you've decided to take things which are actually multi-values and force fit them into single values. Like the, the proper way to the, the proper so the proper way to express aspect ratio is is a ratio of two numbers. It's not a float. Agreed. And so and so once we, and so once we've agreed on that we point, can, we now we that. have now okay. we have x and y and they're instructed again, and now we're back to where we started. And so, so I was willing to live with this crap about having it be a float because I didn't really want to argue about it. But it's clearly wrong. And so, and so, so if we're, we're going to reboot this and we're going to make spurious distinctions based on things being structs or not, then no, I'm not willing to live with that. Look, you can just ignore the aspect ratio line from this example. It's it's not pertinent to this this change. But I think the point is like, how would we represent it? Have it be you know a structure with x and y of 16 and 9, and then have it also have. You know, the, Sure. Well, I mean, and have it be ideal, then you would just say and ideal. How do we make it optional when it's in a struct? I think that's the what you're, the main question. And you're saying it's ideal, right? No, you just replace the 1.777 with a struct that is has an x and a y, or a pair of numbers in an I array. Was just, I was just told that thing, the things that were in structs were hard. Exactly. Unless they say ideal. Well, I, I think Eckert's right that the syntax is more confusing. Because we want the utility of what the default is. I mean, that's and uh, in general, I think what he's saying is that that only works for plain numbers, not for a natural value that is more um, more complicated to express. That requires a curly bracket x comma y and curly bracket, right? Yeah. What what I would prefer, um, since apparently people want. Oh, of course. Look, on any of these examples, if we wanted to change the the 30 there or one of the numbers to be a structure, we can obviously do that. You can, you know, if you look at the label as frame rate and you know that frame rate is supposed to give you, you know, a structure of some sort, then you know what to expect and you can tell whether you got the min ideal thing. So I think that that's a, the, I mean, replacing being able to insert the, the structure for the, the aspect ratio is an orthogonal issue to what, what we're doing here. And I, I get what you're saying here of, of the, the problem is this short form abbreviation is not clear to you what it would be, whether it would be strict or, or whether it would be hard or soft, I guess is the term you're using, right? Um, but our solutions to, to do that would be to change it so it matched. Um, or remove it, that would be the other one, not allow that form, only allow the other form. Um, I'm, you know, I, I think that's, do, do you have a preference on those? Uh, I, 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 
Gary Mundy, I'm Qualcomm Qual Innovation Center. I'm okay with this structure where interpreting min and max as, uh, as hard limits is implied. My concern is, as far as the spec writing process is concerned, normally W3 specifications are written with very sparse code examples. And hopefully it'll be something like an article on HTML5 rocks that actually gives the developers re really, detailed, uh, re re really detailed usage and guidance along with code examples. I think in this case, the current spec has three examples with respect to constraints. We should probably even go further than that and, get, and, uh, and take this and make it uh, make it clear that developers understand that when they say min ideal max, what min means, what max means, and how the UI will interpret ideal in that case. But I'm actually okay with this as, as written. I think it makes sense. It's just that we can match it with the code, with the appropriate specification text. That will be the way to actually get this working. Yeah. Um... From the floor, I'm also okay with this, and I could imagine us removing the short pen notion if that creates confusion. If we could get this done. Sorry, what was that last part? I didn't quite. I, I mean that we remove the possibility to just put a number. You you're yeah. suggesting we remove bare numbers. So, so you, yeah. if necessary, okay. A couple of questions for a clarification. Uh, should you Microsoft? Uh, number one is uh, if we move this logic into the advanced section, what does that mean? Do we need to redefine some of the, the definition here? So advanced is kind of a separate topic, but I, I believe that. that nothing in advanced is ever required. So, all right, that the rule is pretty straightforward. And, and the uh, second thing is. Uh, for uh, let's say I take one example of fishing mode, if I wanted to get either uh, the environment or the external, what we call the unknown or other whatsoever, and how how would you do that with this syntax? So how would you I wanted allow to have environment or one? the unknown? I think that other. If that's if that's allowed, however it is right now, it would mm -hmm. be the same in this. I, I, I'm okay, not even right. sure what that is. No idea. Question is, uh, if you, I wanted to get uh, either uh, environment, the fishing mode, or the uh, uh, unknown, I wanted two options. Yeah, the, the undefined unknown option, the external one. You have to check and, that for yourself. That was part of the previous consensus. Yeah, yeah. So, so the name, you know, we know it's it's to be defined, and either called unknown or other or whatever. And the, what I mean is really the external USB camera. And without really the real physical node in the driver, and what will be the syntax look like for that purpose? If you uh, want to the, the if you want to the, to have a pick a specific camera, you would have to enumerate the cameras using get device uh, get me, get media devices, and you have to have to pick out the ID, and you have to have to put the ID. That in device ID physical mode is not part of the device info, and you don't get. What are you saying? Facing mode is not part facing of, mode. Yeah, the facing mode is not a part of the device information. It is now. It is now. Okay, right. I solved the problem. Thank you. You know what? I don't care. This is repulsive, but I don't care. Fine. But I, I, I want to register. I'm like not happy with the way this is like being presented as like take it or leave it, which is why I just want to fire. How we drain the queue on this one? Okay. What was the remote comment? Gili, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear us. Okay. Um, so I have two concerns with the current proposal. Uh, the first one is that, um, just agreeing with Eric a little bit, that um, it requires us to learn a whole new language, uh, subset, uh, you know, of, of a language just for. Um, just for the sake of um, of getting this to work, and um, whereas I would uh, prefer to just use a JavaScript API of some sort instead of a dictionary. And the second concern is <clears throat> is one that I read on the mailing list, which is that unknown constraints will simply um, be ignored by the browser, and the success um, callback will get fired. So those are my two concerns. Thanks. 
So were you here before lunch? Sorry? Uh, were you listening to the discussion before lunch? Uh, no, no, I just heard of this meeting this time. Uh, part of this of the smooth consensus before lunch mm -hmm. was that we would add a call that gave back all the all the understood names and that people were okay with switching okay. to this yeah, I'm format. Okay with that. So I'm because okay that. Yeah. JavaScript could check it for themselves. So, so, so yeah, that, well, that was a previously discussed item. Okay, so so that does address one of my concerns. It does not address the other concern, which is I, I don't find the syntax to be intuitive. I don't have um, I don't see the benefit of, of forcing users to learn a whole new syntax um, as opposed to just using a JavaScript API that I, I believe would be more expressive and easier to understand. I think that's a topic that, uh, well, it's been beaten to death. <laughs> uh, so that's not part of what we're discussing now. OK. No problem. OK, so let's see if we have. <laughs> I mean, I groaned when I saw this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, given all our misgivings about this, the way, the attempt to capture the before, before lunch discussion on what we could do, yeah, and given that we already have the consensus to do the changes we agreed to before lunch, yeah, Shall we try for seeing if there's rough consensus in the in the part of the of the task force present in the room, to put it exact a little more exactly, to switch to this, to switch to something resembling what's currently presented, or shall we allow Peter to try for this one? Uh, raise your hands if you think that this is a promising position that should be turned into a to a, to a comp complete proposal now. Raise your hand if you think that we should move back to the base to the base consensus from before lunch and not pursue what Peter has just presented. Go ahead. Yeah. No. I, sorry, this was this was a joke for level three. We're, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're going ahead. We have seem to have smooth consensus in the room to go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's still June seventh, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> as soon as you can get it to us. Couple weeks. Um, okay. So we are now officially closing the media capture part for this meeting, I hope for the last time. And everyone moves over to the WebRTC channel in IRC. And um, uh, hopefully Ted will be able to show a new agenda. <laughs> While Ted uh, looks it up uh, as usual. We need a scribe. Jan Ivar, is it your turn? Yeah, thank you. We got the scribe.
So we're now precisely back on schedule because it's 1.30. So here is the agenda for, for the rest of the day. Stats, followed by identity, coffee, interoperability issues, and then uh, we will we'll wrap up. And it's not completely correct. We will, well, someone has updated it. Uh, we will end by 4.30, regardless of what is happening, because people have flights to catch. Okay, let's get started on the stats part. So I now, I'm told, uh, I now remember that I was told to stand, stand here so that I, my head is in camera. So stats definitions. What's happened since, uh, what happened with the stats is that I've been working on Getting the actual stats proposal with uh, the stats names and variables and so on to at least reflect the stuff that uh, Google has uh, found interesting or useful in its development and uh, incorporate feedback as we go along. Next slide. So. The assumption is that everyone knows what the stats API is, and that everyone knows the principles of stats. Otherwise, you should go back to the TPAC presentation I gave to, that has a little bit more about principles. So I'm assuming that what we have done before is not going to change, but that we're, but this discussion is about what stats to define, because the working group hasn't actually looked at those in any detail officially so far, apart from being on the mailing list. Next. Process last six months, API defined unchanged. I put up a wiki page that has the, the, the stats definitions I've been working from. Jan Ivar has been very good at uh, reading web IDL. I think he has, actually has a web IDL compiler that understands dictionary, unlike me. Uh, and input from experience with the uh, stats that Google has defined as Google star, uh, when which we have added when needed, discovered why they're badly defined, and, uh, and mucked around with them. So I think the object model is fairly complete, and it reflects the model of the underlying protocols fairly precisely. With some warts, we'll, we'll return to that. Uh, so it's kind of obvious how to do it, I hope, because obvious is more likely to be correct. Next. So this is a link to the page where the stats are defined. There are three new classes of objects that are there since the, what, what is in the editor's draft. One is the media stream check objects, which contain all the media that is, the stats per, pertinent to media. For instance, frame rate doesn't really make sense on an SLRC. It's, not, it's a wrong abstraction level. So frame rate went to the media, uh, media stream check object. And I broke up codecs because they have lots of knobs as separate objects so that you you can ask things like, okay, which, what's the name of the codec and what's this FMTP field and so on and so forth. And uh, there are objects for ICE candidate pairs and for ICE candidates, the price. All the network inf information belongs on ICE candidates. 
and as candidates peers, including yet another set of byte counters. And we have data channel objects that contain just com counters and configuration info so that we can get some basic information about what data channels are doing. We don't know yet exactly what we need to know about data channels. That will come with using them in practice, I hope. Next. There are some tricky stuff. One of them is audio volume. I kind of turned to my coworker who knows something about audio, he's a musician, and asked, okay, what's the, what's the audio level? How do you define it? And he looked at me and said, ah, that's a hard question. Because what do you want when you say audio level is highly application dependent? Even which units you have is not well defined. The DB from overload seems to be like the most common thing we have, but it's uh, not that easy. And, and of course, uh, whether you actually measure the, the technical volume uh, or you measure the perceived volume, which it requires some signal processing, and of course, which interval you measure over. So these, these were trick, turn, turned out to be questions that were trickier than I, than I thought. So, I, so I'm worried about that one. Another one is inter-object pointers. I think we have comments on volume. Yeah, because uh, I think Tim Terryberry sent it, an item to the list with a pointer to a spec that has fairly wide um, acceptance in the audio community. Um, I, I, not to say that I know these things, but um, he sent a pointer to the spec and it's got a well-defined way of defining, deriving a number from audio and I don't see why we wouldn't use that. Cool. When, when did it send it? Um, quite some time ago. Okay. Then I have to dig back I, into our I, 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 I believe that, that that text he sent is actually all in the uh, IETF RTC web audio draft, in, in fact. But it's about actually measuring the level here. And what I was going to say is you, all those things you said totally true, but luckily what we want here is not the audio volume. What we want is the change in the audio volume, which is fairly is is very decisively representable in DB. I think it's pretty much the norm. So, um, I mean, we, you have no idea how big the person's speaker is or anything like that. You're not actually trying to set the audio level. You're just trying to say whether it should go up or down in a very systematic way so we get the same effects from one browser to the next. And um, I, I think Tim will tell you. More about, but anyway. You're right. It's a hard problem, and luckily we have excerpts who I believe have delivered us an answer. <laughs> Good. I'll uh, read the audio draft carefully and see if I can figure out what what Tim is telling me. Uh, don't. It's a different thing. It's about how to normalize what's coming in off our microphones to put them at the correct level such that we can represent DB overload type thing. Okay. I'm I'm fairly certain Tim has provided text on this specific point. Sorry. And it is separate to what yeah. I think Kellen was yeah. thinking. Um, if he hasn't. Um, he will. Did you get something from the IRC? Yeah, so Ted, Ted pointed out there's an EBU specification or something along those lines. That and Tim the pointer is in the, is in the Jabber room. Yeah. IRC. Oh, sorry for remote people. I'm just saying in IRC, there's a link to what Tim uh, recommended in the mailing list, which is EBU R128 um, uh, Tech Doc 3344. So another problem I have is that I have a lot of variables that are the stats ID of other stats objects. And of course, when I had to have some variables that are named ID, we had a name clash. So Looking for advice, we could rename all this, uh, all these effective pointers to use a, a suffix of stat or stat ID or something like that. I'd like to have a uni uniform way to recognize them when you read the 
read the spec, but that's all. No comments on that? I, I don't know if this is comment 22 or not, or not, but why can't you actually point at the thing that you're talking about with an actual, you know, object reference thing? Mainly because I have, uh, uh, because uh, the, at the level I'm generating this, I don't, I don't have, I haven't built the object I can point to yet. Uh, but I know what its ID is going to be. But we have a solution for that, don't we? <laughs> Post-processing? No. We, we do have those objects now. No, I mean, uh, at the level in the code where I generate these objects, I don't have the other object uh, yet. That's, that's so a secondary I'd, issue. I'd have to dereference de de it. But that, that's just uh, my implementa an implementation. That's, that's just an implementation concern. At the, at the API, why, why can't we just provide the object that's, that, that's affected? Um, we actually have most of those objects now. And um, we were discussing the need for potentially more than what was presented in, in Justin's proposal. Um, you seem to have some fairly good use cases here for them. Um, why not that? We have a doohickey one, doohickey two, doohickey three, and we can point at all of those ones concretely as opposed to with some sort of abstract identifier. I think that'll be more intuitive for people using the API. I'm sorry to spring it on you like this. I, I hinted at it earlier, but um, I think this is going to be a bit more usable for people. I've, it's what I've always wanted anyway. So. <laughs> so you're saying that the ID sort of references the actual object yeah. that corresponds to them? Yeah. So, so what happens for like embedded objects? Like, you know, you, you get stats on, you know, we have the doohickey use ice transport, DTLS transport. So those return embedded objects, like candidate pairs and stuff like that. How do, how do those objects get referenced? So you, I mean, are, are we on that path? Yeah, so you're actually losing one property of, uh, of stats when you do that, which is they're a snapshot. They're a snapshot that can be timestamped, and they won't change after, after you snap them. That's the probably snapshot. It's always snapshot, though, right? Yeah, the object. Well, are you suggesting that you're going to pull the objects for the stats, or the pointers could still be? No. So, so, so Harold's point here is that you can generate stats when the when the peer connection is closed, and potentially all of these intermediate objects that represent transient state may have been. Garbage collected, I suppose, is, is the only case that, that this would well, be a valid actually, concern, I think. Actually, I'm more worried about the case where, I'm also thinking about the case where you get the stats for three different objects, and you have some computation that depends on having a consistent picture of all three, and you make that computation one and a half seconds after you collected the stats, and one of them has updated, two of them has, haven't. Uh, that's relatively straightforward, isn't it? We can just, if, if you pull things um, between two steady states, then there should be a consistent view. I, I think that's probably reasonable. You're not even guaranteed a consistent view based on RTCP from the remote side. So stats could update out of sync uh, you know, for things like you know, packet loss and stuff that reported. That's what, that, so that's, that was the reason why I, why I put uh, timestamps in, so that you can tell what. What, when the stats are actually from. Right, right. right. Yeah. That, that, that was where I was getting to. Yeah. Okay, I was but, going to come uh, say, I like the current solution, because keep doing that, but it seems like you could still, that's yeah. sep completely separable from what you're proposing. Yeah. But don't change that part of your current proposal. I guess, <laughs> yep. so, so, are you saying uh, you couldn't do get stats, though, with no specifier and then get the full DOM? Or are you saying that you could only get stats on, I mean, like, just to address Harold's concern, you know, if you did get stats and got the full DOM, you still had the ID, you know, ID pointers, you could still get everything on one snapshot. So that's, uh, so you're actually suggesting a change to the API, with, which was a couple of slides back saying that I'm, I'm not doing this at the moment. So let's, you go back to let's slide? pursue that, pro that proposal on the list and, uh, and uh, in pri private conversation, because uh, that, that's a complete, uh, 
if you're actually pointing to the live objects instead of just a snapshot of the stats on the object, that's a complete change in model, and I'd like to discuss that thoroughly before switching. Can you go back to the slide that you're referring to? Because I didn't remember anything being. Uh, so, uh, one back, I think. Yeah, this discussion is about. Yep. More cowbell? Okay. Keep the mic. Okay. So let's go forward again. Click, click, click. click. Corner stuff two. Conditional present stats. For example, media stream track might have stats variables that depend on, uh, on whether it's a video or audio track. Suggestion is that we should, as a matter of principle, well, we'll see how it works out in practice. If, if things are conditionally present, there should be some, some kind of value to say, OK, this object is of that class, so you can expect these variables. For instance, saying this is a video track. Uh, another uh, thorny issue is that uh, we got network performance stats with uh, stuff like available bandwidth, uh, configured bandwidth, and, and congestion states, and so on. These are not standardized. How they are computed are not standardized. I think, and I never liked, or I never enjoyed sampled variables where you monitor something that you want to see if it goes up or down, and you have to, and you can just sample the value in at, uh, uh, at intervals, because it might have gotten up and then down and then up again in that interval. So this is kind of mumble. I'm, I prefer counters. Controls, on the other hand, like target bitrate, I think that's a, that's okay to expose as a value, before because that's what it is at the current moment. When it's when it's changing, it's changing. It doesn't make uh, sen that much sense to sum up how, what I put the target bitrate at for, uh, for each second of the last 30 seconds. So think about that. Next slide. Was that the last one? Oh, more work. Can so you, Can you go back for a second? Yep. So the video discriminator, how, how are you expecting that to work? So I'm expecting to. So at the moment, a media stream track, um, no, an SSRC, what was No. A media stream track doesn't have a pointer uh, to the codec, actually. So it doesn't have the information. So I'm suggesting to add a variable that says either video or audio. That is the media type. OK. So next slide. As soon as, I, as soon as I find an on switch. Is this better, Randall? Good. Then we hope it works. And uh, I got a feeling that I'm going to have to do like this. My labels are not high enough or something. Uh, so what I'm suggesting to do next is to Take this wiki page, transform it into respec, and publish it as a W3C document. That will involve saying, taking all the specific stats values defined, stats objects, out of the basic WebRTC spec, and say, this is a separate document. It doesn't have to be published at, exact, at exactly the same time as the WebRTC document. I mean, it wouldn't make much sense to publish it before, but it can be delayed or be updated with new versions. 
and that we, for at least this year, keep it as a living document. That is, we, we publish new drafts whenever we need to add, st add more stats values. Will the WebRTC spec normatively depend on this? Because a lot of the functionality that we need isn't possible without at least some of these stats. Should it? I think it has to, yes. Because we can't, it's not possible to build systems that are usable and workable in a really practical way. I think these are, many of these are features that need to be in, in the base spec. I'm not quite sure how we represent or do that from a process point of view. But yes, I think to say that you're WebRTC compliant and build one of those things, there are certain things that we need to know we can count on in, in there. Yep, and we have no method that's fancy. So yeah, I don't think making it a normative reference to the main spec makes sense. You only make a normative reference if you need this stuff to implement the core spec, which I don't think is correct. I mean, I don't know that we have talked or even made any decision on whether we would define something as WebRTC compliant. And I guess one of the first question would be whether it would have any effect or not. But um, I don't suggest we use the reference game to achieve this result. So yeah, I, I would agree that the norm, there has to be a normative reference to some of it. That doesn't mean there has to be a normative reference to everything that's on the wiki. So there, there can be some discretion there. So um, Harold, what I would re request then is that you leave, since the stats have always been in the, the main document, that's always been the plan for them, you leave the bit step stats there, and then you make a set of extended stats in a second document, and we can go through trying to figure out which stat goes in which. Is that workable for you? Because I don't think I like it, but because I, well, we, we, the, the idea that, uh, the, the, the nice thing about the registry is that you have one place to look for everything. And if we abandon the registry, as I'm suggesting that we do, I'd still like to have one place for everything. And I would rather say that we publish the baseline stats as version one and immediately start editing for version two, which incorporates the extended stuff. Would that work for you? As long as the main WebRTC spec says that implementations must implement the things in the base spec, that would totally work for me. Okay. So, this one, one thorny issue that came up yesterday, which only people who love and appreciate uh, RTCP and ICE will uh, appreciate, which is, do we have, really have to represent the component? So Justin suggested that in a doohickey model, we represent transports and say, Okay, if we ha really have to have a second component, we can have uh, a, another transport object and a po pointer from the first one to the second one. And I'm suggesting we do that in the stats model too. That loses one level of abstraction, but it's a level of abstraction that I'm really hoping nobody ever needs. So um, I, I think that it would be a shame to miss counting all those bytes that you're sending over the RTCP transport um, in the case that we do decide not to represent the RTCP non-MUX RTCP transport um, with an object. Um, in that case, I'd, I'd kind of push for something like rolling those stats up into, into the one bundle and just having the, the RTCP transport inaccessible through the API. Would that work? So, so your stats for the RTP transport would naturally include all of the RTCP stats. The number of bytes that you sent would count both, all of those sorts of things. Does that sound reasonable? I mean, uh, some of the stats you're getting from, from XR anyway, so that they sort of naturally 
Yeah, um, so that, in that so that you anyway. always count in one single transport object both the RTP and the RTCP, no matter whether the the, the one there's one or two of them. Yeah. There, the, there's a little problem with that, which is not the byte counters, but the IP addresses. Sure. If the IP addresses of the RTCP are different, are the same. As for the RTP, then that's there's no problem. If they're different, then you need somewhere to put that representation. But so so that's that's the same line of arguing that says that we need uh, a separate transport object for the RTCP transport when it is separate. Yeah. If we decide that we don't want the separate object because we want to distance ourselves as much as possible from the non-MUX cases, then we simply won't make those IP addresses available through stats to bad. Yeah, so the the suggestion I was thinking I was making is that in a, in a MUX case, we only have one object called a transport object. And in a non-MUX case, we have a transport object and an element in a transport object that's called, and, and by the way, here's the RTCP, which points to another transport object. Well, you're just arguing for a separate object at that point, and, and and if we want a separate object, we should have a separate object. Yeah, I. I, um, I mean, uh, Uwe Rauschenbach, um, I'm not happy with um, not exposing it. If if we don't max, we should expose the information in one one way or the other. I mean, um, I have no strong opinion about whether. We have a separate transport object, or we have some some fields in the um, in the one transport object for that RTP RTCP stream, but we should uh, be able to access the information. Justin Uberti, I think we'll be sad if we try to add up the bytes going over two different things. Uh, I think we'll say, well, we took a shortcut. We wish we hadn't taken that. So I'm not sure we need to expose it. But if we do, why don't we just have a separate stats object, and it can point to a hidden, you know, object, uh, you know, ice transport object that's not exposed to the DOM. Oh, right. If we're giving out the, the thing. So let's. Uh, There's no frobs on it. You know, it's, it's read only, so that's fine. Yeah. So, uh, so I think we have a rough consensus that stats should speak the truth. <laughs> <laughs> And that uh, if we have two two transports, which will actually actually expose those two transports, but exactly how to do it, I think we, I'll make a suggestion on this. So, if there are no other comments, I will just say, okay, I'll do this next. Yeah, sounds good. And the conclusion was that we needed some language that made stats normative to implement. For a web artisan implementation. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Harold. Next item is identity and its implications on security. I'll do this. Last one that I sent, I don't know what that one was. Whether this is it or not, just just scroll it and we'll see. There should be option one, option two. Uh, yeah. Yep, good. All the way back up. Yeah, let's go on to the next one now. I think we had a sort of foreshadowing of some of this already. Uh, I think I already got this answer. Um, request identity is, a, is an RTC. Uh, request identity is, a, is a, an option that we provide on the constructor um, for peer connection and also on the it's called set configuration now, I think. Or have we not landed on a particular name for that? Anyway. Um, it has three values, yes, if configured, no, uh, and we don't intend to use it and we don't know that anyone 
we don't know if anyone else intends to use it, but my proposal is that we remove it until such time as we know that someone actually wants it. Justin said, yep. Did anyone else have any reason to keep it? So the, so the, the reason that this was in, originally included was so that we could distinguish it between essentially three different classes of identity usage. No, I don't want identity usage. Yes, I want identity usage. And I'm not going to provide you with any identity provider, but if you've got one, use it. And that was the sort of default, the if configured. And you know, I was talking to Eka and we figure that if we have an identity provider and someone doesn't actually provide one and the users, you know, say, signed into the browser, we'll just provide you an identity assertion. You can choose to choose to scrub it if you want to, if you don't want to share it. So we don't need it. Does anyone else want it? Sold. Next. I sent the pull request already, so. Ah, this picture again. <laughs> All right, so we talked about this. Next. All right, here we go. Grind, 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 grind. Yep, OK. So gum scopes the peer identity property to all tracks in the stream that you get back, which is at most one of each type that gum supports. That is one or two. So you have a number of tracks that get tagged with this peer identity property and get isolated. The tracks can be separated and mixed and put into a different different streams where they retain that property and they can get cloned and they retain that property. But ultimately, um, the the control surface is the group of tracks that you get in a single call to gum. If you want to ask for one track without with audio with and video without, then you have to make two calls to gum. That's just how it works. My suggestion here is that. Um, RTC peer connection scope um, scopes the, the sort of same level of controls to the RTC peer connection and not at any other granularity, which means to say that any isolated track added to a peer connection will cause the peer connection to, to negotiate isolation on all DTLS sessions that it negotiates with whoever it negotiates them with. We don't actually know who they're negotiating with because it's not our business to know these things. So the effect of that is that if you have a single isolated track, no matter where it is, and you have some unisolated tracks added to peer connection, you'll be requesting that the remote side respect the isolation property for all of those tracks. And it simplifies things a lot. Um, that, that means that if I have isolated video and not isolated audio, and I send them to someone else, they will see isolated video, isolated audio. We could. So just to be clear, isolated to the same. So it'll be isolated. Same way. The application can't touch it. Both of Related them. with the same restrictions, whatever they are. Yeah. If you want, if you want Just separate isolation properties, you're going to have to create separate peer connections. Now, I have an al alternatives here, which is to scope to the track. That's not possible because the IETF is not providing us with those tools. We've already discussed that. Or we could scope the to a DTLS connection. Uh, that leads to sort of craziness. So I'm just confirming that we're all happy with the carrying the scope to the peer connection and. Question uh, should in Microsoft uh, just to clarify. So it's uh, up to the application from the web server to drive the whole process, right? For example, yes, absolutely. The app expected to to know whether uh, any of the track are gonna be uh, having the peer identity or not. And, yes, uh, absolutely. Okay, right. Yeah. So so the app shouldn't create a DTLS connection without the isolation and create the one with isolation afterwards. 
and then that will create a problem, I think, for the browser and for everything underneath. Yeah, so, so the main advantage of all of this is simplifying the, the conceptual model. We have one way of dealing with tracks that come out of the peer connection. We don't have to worry about, oh, this one's come off a DTLS connection that had isolation negotiated and this one didn't and now we're putting them in the same stream. And now, now we can. Yeah, be helpful in the spark. We can uh, clarify, you know, if we have a transport established already, and then uh, uh, you know, another one coming in. Next slide. It, it's on future slides. Okay, right. Thank you. We'll, we'll wait for that one. Uh, yeah, okay. So next. Oh. Uh, here's the big question. All right. So that's talking about the local scope. So I create a peer connection, I, I add some streams to it. If any one of them are isolated, I'll be asking for isolation. But what happens when the other side has a different idea about what the session is supposed to look like? So we have two options. We can either fail to create the session or we can force all of the streams on the remote side to effectively become isolated when they come off the network as well. And if we go to the, the next slide, I'm sort of exploring the options here. Um, I'm not sure what Wait, it I'm, is. I'm sorry, I'm confused because I thought that's what we, you said we just decided on, so I'm sort of missing. Okay. I was I was only really thinking about the local scope. So, the one directional case. So where I I set up a peer connection with some tracks and send them to someone else. What do I want that other person to see at the other end? I thought and, you and just the said they were was, all isolated. They're all isolated. Yes. Right. Now, what happens when it's a bidirectional session that we're talking about here? They've got non-isolated tracks on their end. Their expectation is they're setting up a peer connection with no isolation properties at all. You're expecting to set it up with isolation properties. What do we do when it comes to negotiating this, this session? Now, I, I think we're going to arrive at the conclusion that I think we're going to arrive at, but let's, I, I just want to walk through it. First. So in this one, if you have different expectations at, at either end of this connect, connection, you can have the session fail to negotiate. That's Actually, what ALPN says, if you can't agree, then you can fail the connection. I think that's bad. Uh, next, please. Ah, so there is an advantage to doing it this way. It means um, that Either all tracks are isolated, oh, here we go. Nah, this is, this so is this may become else. obvious later, but I think what's confusing me is that this, this seems is, like an this, RTC this web now. discussion and not a web RTC discussion, so I'm... No, so, yeah. so this, is, this is what do we want. And my, my hopes was to, to have this discussion before we had the, the other discussion, but... Okay, all right. Um, you probably said that I'm just, just trying to connect. I'm just, wind, I'm just winding, it, winding it back through this. Um, this is actually not valid uh, anymore because of the decision that we're sort of talking about. Um, there was a possibility of making the RTC peer connection require that all tracks be isolated or all tracks be not isolated, which would give us this property. So let's let's just move on to the, the decision part, um, steps. Um, yeah, don't worry about that. Next. So this is this is the option I think we're going to end up with, and that is. If any track is isolated, you'll request isolation on the from the. You'll request that the opposite end of the, the remote end of the connection respect isolation for all the tracks that it receives, regardless of whether they were isolated on your end or not. I push some media in, it becomes isolated. Um, correct. So, sorry. So the impact here is that if either side asks for isolation, you get isolation. Yes. That seems like the right answer. And, and, and I think this is the simplest way for this to work. I mean, we, we, could, we could do per track marking, but it, it ultimately comes back to the same decision that we made this morning regarding the same thing. It, this simplifies it beyond belief. It, it pretty much has to be this way. You can't have like the front door unlocked and the back door locked, right? Both doors have to be locked, so it... it, it. Uh, well, you can, but uh, yeah. So question on this uh, picture. 
this will mean that uh, browser A thinks that uh, correct that uh, browser that browser B is sending isolated tracks, but uh, browser B can still run a, a JavaScript plugin that places funny hats on, his, on the top of his head, right? Correct. Now, this, this is because we want to have a cake. And the cake that we're talking about here is that when I grant permission for a site to access my camera in this restricted fashion, I know that that's being respected. That's the cake. The icing is knowing where media came from, and that basically removes that advantage. We'd have to use some other mechanism to identify that in a secure fashion so that we can say this media is being, it comes from hta at google.com and no one else. We, can't, we don't get that property from this. This is why I wanted to have the discussion. OK, so it, it's highly possible that I just don't understand how this all works. Um, the question that I have is that it seems to me that the isolation context you have in browser A may be completely different from the isolation context you might or might not have in browser B, right? So right. in browser A, I gave permission for my media to be used by you know, Fluffy, you know, some particular site where um, Fluffy's been authenticated. But that doesn't mean that the media coming from there, I don't understand what it means to isolate the media coming from there to me if the person there never gave any kind of permission, authentication, anything for what, uh, what they would actually expect for isolation coming back to me. So, so isolation is merely a, a, a lowering of access for the application. That's, that's but all lowering to what? Because normally to we can... You can render this, that's it, period. So when you, when you acquire media with the peer identity constraint, you can do two things with it. One is send it to the person that you've identified, and the other one is render it. When you pull it off the network, and peer connection has identified that the DTLS session has been negotiated with this new tag that we're talking about, you can pull it off the network and render it, period. That's it. Suppose Browser B is engaged in some sort of conference call where he is sending his media to multiple people. Correct, yeah. Person, Browser A now joins and specifies isolation Browser B only. Yeah. Does that just completely break Browser B's conference call that he gets dropped from all the other people? I mean, or no, do no, I just because, not understand this Because uh, Browser B, seeing Browser A's isolated media, can render it. Yeah. Um, it doesn't affect where Browser B can send any of his media. Uh, any of his own media. Okay. Yeah. He's he's sending his unconstrained media, you know, full access media, down a pipe that's restricted. That's that's perfectly fine. Right. So, from so his perspective, it's, it's in this. So, okay. browser A's media is isolated on browser B. Yes. And browser B's media is isolated on browser A. Yes. But browser B's media can also go to anybody else in the world, however it wants. Correct. Okay. Right. And and in this model, in this particular example, browser B may not even have a valid identity for browser A. They don't even know, they don't necessarily have to have to have an identity for browser A in order to complete this. Um, identity is asymmetric, which allows for interesting scenarios where you call your bank and you know that you're talking to, to a particular person at the bank, but they don't necessarily know who you are until such time as you want to offer that information to them. Question. Oh, sure. uh, question here. If I'm a uh, brother B here, I'm, uh, I'm receiving uh, four uh, streams yes. and the two from brother A. Then I need to, uh, from the user agent perspective, I need to, to know which two streams are coming from brother A, right? Yes, absolutely. If it's only one is uh, in the isolation mode, I still need to, need to detect they're coming actually from the same person, from the same brother. And how do I do that without any other signaling uh, channel? At, at the receiving side, the only thing that you really need to know yeah. is that the source of this media is the network. Uh -huh. And the DTLS connection that that media came off, effectively, 
was negotiated with isolation on or off. If it's on, mark the media as isolated. You're on your way. So, so that means for both of the streams coming from brother A, and they should be a mark as isolated. Both of the streams. Both of the streams. Yes, all of the streams coming off that off that session, off that peer connection, will be if will be isolated. Only one stream is marked as uh, isolated, and uh, the user agent doesn't have any any way to detect the other one. It's from the same same uh, sender or not, right? So I'm not sure where where we're getting at here, but if if you have two separate peer connections. Yeah, let's say one is video, one is audio. Those two, two totally separate ice connections, separate DTLS transport. Yeah, but, but, the, the, one but is, the requirement here is that the peer connection will negotiate the DTLS transports yeah. yes. with the isolation property attached to those transports. So maybe it would help to imagine that an isolated peer connection creates a separate origin. Yes. And once you have that model, basically anything that comes through that uh, peer connection is protected by the cross-origin policy. Okay, right. That means both of the streams coming from A to B will be marked as uh, okay. Always. Right. Yep. Requirement to the app, really. Okay. Requirement for browsers, yes. To the the web page, really. Oh, the, 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 web, the, web, the, the web page doesn't have any say in it at this point. The web page has made the peer connection. Web page, I think the way to, to put it there is to, when you cut, uh, Get user media. You put a peer identity there, right? That's a way to make sure the stream is marked as a. That is one isolated. way to do that. Yes. And if you call the audio, for example, microphone, and you kind of get user media without that, let's assume you create the streams, the tracks separately, and then uh. Anyway, I think yes. that's one example. I think maybe we should go through the you know detailed steps. So. Right. So thanks. Martin, can I just confirm? Um, so I think where I've had the trouble is that in my mind. I probably connected too closely authentication and isolation, and maybe the difference. Is, authentication is something you go through to you know you you log in, and that can result in isolation of a certain type. But there are a variety of ways you can get isolation, including this, that actually have nothing to do with the authentication process you might go through. Right. So the authentication process is only required so that you can actually have the more isolated media actually get through. So if, you, if you're not authenticated and you have isolated media, it goes nowhere. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Right. Can we have the next slide, please? Yay. Okay, next. Ah, this is the fun one. So I've had a couple of questions about these sorts of things. So you establish a session, you add a track, or you change the tracks that are being sent um, to it. You, you add isolated tracks to an, an existing session. You change the isolation properties of a track in an existing session. What happens? So the rule here is that if you don't have a DTLS, because the isolation properties for the DTLS connection are established at the time the connection's made and thereafter cannot change. Um, yeah, this, this, <laughs> this whole, no. Eka said something about renegotiation, which we're trying to put a bullet in, in TLS. And we did put a bullet um, last week. So, Jonathan. Yeah, so if, um, if adding an isolated track to the peer connection is what causes it to be isolated, and um, if you uh, then what happens if you do have the model of if you want it to be isolated, but you start the peer connection with just a, da uh, da a data channel, and then later want to add isolated tracks? Is there any way to do that, or are you screwed? You're kind of screwed there. If, there you're, if, you're, if you're bundling, if you're bundling yeah. at that point, so so well, you, you have an it's... existing DTLS connection. Yep. And you've negotiated a non-isolated session, which will be the mode. Yeah, yeah. I mean, get. let's say I know I want these to be isolated, but I don't have any tracks yet. Is there any way to do uh, that? I have a solution for that. OK. Um, so the solution for that is um, the peer identity restriction on the peer connection. Okay. The other question. We haven't talked about that. OK. 
Okay. The other question I had, which might also be something coming up later or you haven't thought about yet, is is the isolation just the media proper or is various metadata and stats and the like also restricted? Currently, it's just the media and it leaks the size of the video and that's all it leaks as far as I'm aware. Uh, all stats as well, I guess. Yeah, so, so the idea is that you're going to get stats because that sort of information is available to a network-based attacker anyway. Yeah. And that's the basic model that we're I think operating we, here. If we ever add any stats that look hazardous, we'll notice, try to notice that then. And, and I mean, we can add a security consideration section to the stats that says, like, don't, please do not, like, you know, give millisecond by millisecond, like, volume levels. <laughs> Okay. And maybe maybe we don't provide audio levels for for isolated media or something like that. I'm, maybe maybe stats is the wrong thing to be using for audio levels in the first place. Maybe it's a track property. I, I have a question on your last bullet. Do you mean that a track that is in use becomes isolated? Yeah. So the how, how do you do that? I thought it was when you did get user media, you determined. So so there are other other sorts of um, isolation properties that tracks can get. So get user media is not the only way that you can get a track. We talked about the capture stream until ended, um, capture stream APIs. And as it turns out, those, uh, those APIs have some interesting holes. And I see Dom smiling because he, he finally gets it, right? Um, so say you're sourcing uh, a video tag from a website and you're using Dash or some sort of streaming protocol to pull down chunks of this video to, and then you get a redirect. Suddenly the origin for that media becomes some other origin entirely and the web model requires that you, if, unless it's got the proper cause authorization on it, it forces you to go across origin. That track becomes isolated. Now it also be, it's also the case that that track cannot be sent over a peer connection because it's not peer identity tagged in any way, but it means that we have to respect the fact that tracks can over time change their properties. And web audio is another case. If you take um, web audio is actually always access, accessible to the current origin. I think that's the that's the principle there. But um, say we were to add this capture stream from Canvas, for instance and we were to render a cross-origin image to the canvas, that would taint the canvas, force the resulting stream to become cross-origin, and therefore we would have to stop sending media for that, for that stream. Even though we would still be showing the user the image, we couldn't pipe it across the network. So it's complicated. Yeah, so how does this work with Jonathan's case where you, know, you start with the data channel and then you yeah. add something that's just, you're just pulling from video and you think everything's fine and then all of a sudden, you know, kind of like all hell breaks loose because of Yeah, so the, there's, the video. there's this um, peer identity RTC configuration thing that we've been talking about. And, that, and I think that has two properties. And I'm not sure if this has been properly um, articulated, but we... No, no, I keep going. I mean, but, right. but the properties that we're, that we're looking for here, I think, is um, when you provide the RTC configuration that says peer identity foo, that says don't allow a session to to complete unless you have a valid identity assertion that says foo and you've checked it and also that you want the media to be isolated at that point. I'm not sure if that's that's what we want, but that that would be one way of dealing with that. That would be my suggestion. Yeah. Um, I guess I would suggest also that this first case, um, because there's no, um, I mean, so, so your 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 assumption is that you might become isolated by doing a renegotiate by doing a renegotiation. No, no. So the the idea here not, is not that a, not a, not a TTS renegotiation, but a a negotiation needed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so say you, you you're sending isolated media and you find some non um oh, sorry you're, you're sending non isolated media and you've got a happy open session and the and the site can do whatever right. it wants and you find an isolated track and you jam it in the peer connection. Right. You do the negotiation. So both these cases cause our negotiation needed. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I mean, either this should cause a negotiation needed, or the, or the first one at least should be should be forbidden, because I, if there's no way if there's no way to become to become isolated, then like this should be an error. I think they should cause a negotiation needed, that w and that will solve the problem acceptably. 
So adding a track causes on negotiation needed, I think, is, 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 good, is fine, true in any, that, which is true in any case. Or it should be true in any case if we, if we make it true in any case. I, th I think that is almost always true, though I'm, I'm sure there's some edge case where it's not. I, I'm not sure that we actually said what happened if you added a track to a stream. Um, well, that's, that's not happening anymore. Now, 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 you have, now you have to call dot add track, right? Yeah. So, so say you added a track to the peer connection. This should almost always cause a negotiation. That should cause on negotiation needed. I can't imagine any way that you would be able to get right. around that. And so now, and so now they'll have to side effects that that cause you to do details negotiation. Yeah. yeah. So the only concern is if you're doing the whole switching in, switching out thing that we've been talking about, with with the the aim of not doing a renegotiation, that this would potentially cause a problem because you have different isolation properties on the things you're switching in and out, and you need to catch that. And this has been implemented as an invariant. So basically, for every frame that we're sending. We check to see the origin of the, the the stream that we're pulling from, and if it doesn't match, we send black instead. So, uh, Colin here. So, when you, you say there's a negotiation needed, yeah. um, and it's going to be one where you, it's changing the the value of the, the, the TLS. So, you're going to you're going to basically close and reopen the DTLS connection. Yes, right. Well, you, you you would have to if you want to be able to send that media. Yes. R right, right. Which is what we need to have happen. Um, I'm just wondering about. Yeah. And you're going to be and this, let's say you know the SDP changed because you added a track, right? Yeah. We're we're going to have like these, like we need to walk through the race conditions very carefully here so that we don't have one side thinking the whole thing failed right when it's actually trying to renegotiate. Right, because you're going to have the DTLS connection close with no real reason why. It's, it's and that's going to be lines, the SDP arriving. It'll be just like an ice cream start, right? Yeah, we could treat it like that. Or just new, new M lines for the for the new isolated media. Okay, so uh, th that makes sense with ice cream start. I, I was wondering whether we were going to end up needing to indicate the ALPN value in the SDP where we set this up. That's what that I was, was really getting to. That was part of the process to. that I was I was trying to get through um, here, and I. I can't Across quite, that bridge, I can't we come to it. Justify adding okay. it yet? Good. Well, well, let's not if we don't have but, to. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. Okay. Um, but the only reason you would do that is to try to prevent, uh, provide early detection capabilities. As a security property, you want to rely on what's coming over the connection. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's all I have. I've got an, I've got an action to um, clarify some things. I think. Specifically, the question that Jonathan asked, which was a good one. <clears throat> well, my question was more related to the proposed schedule Harald presented yesterday. It seems to me that there is a lot of lot of stuff to sort out here from ALPM. Uh, unfortunately, I missed that discussion. Another meeting? Yeah, you weren't here. We, we, we said last call for the WebRTC 1.0 in late September. Okay, good luck with that. Um, I don't see any reason why this couldn't be done well before then. Okay, that, that's my question. Hey, I just realized I had another question on the previous slide about the whole how things can fail. Is that implying that you just you send silence forever or you send silence until the, in the DTLS renegotiation, whatever that means, happens, and if that means a complete teardown and re-up. Because, I mean, I would be sad if, you know, I did something with the JavaScript and I, and my streams just started sending black forever without me knowing about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there's part of, part of the problem with this is there are, there are failure modes in which you get black um, indefinitely. And, and I mean, it, those modes are... Uh, Unfortunate, but I, I think unavoidable is part of it. I'd, 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 be, I'd, be, I'd rather have something that does give me a callback saying, hey, something, you know, at least, yeah. you know, any, anything that can be an error because like, of an action I did caused a problem, having that fail rather okay. than cause black to silently set seems like it would be preferable. Yeah. Asynchronous so the, yeah. 
The only cases that, that are actually problematic are the ones where the track changes isolation state, at which point we don't really have any way to surface that information anywhere. Uh, that's not something that w that's something we'd have to talk about in the media stream context. Um, I sent round an email about, you know, do we need to know whether a particular track is isolated or not, and suggested that we didn't, and didn't get any response to that. So, if anyone has any opinions that, and to the contrary, then let me know. Um. I just want to say Jonathan's question is a, like a more precise version of what I was trying to come up with, which is, you know, sort of what are the what are the cases where your sort of naive or beginning developer can find themselves in a horrible situation where things not working, you know? And I always keep going back to the, the the simple demo case, right? You're trying to show somebody, and you just got, you know, you're on the same network. You're just trying to show them um, basic WebRTC, right? And you know, when you have things just fail and they fail in a horrible way that you can't predict and you can't tell what's happened, that's, it's just nice to avoid that if possible. So I don't know what the answer is here. Um, you know, having to renegotiate is an example of one of those things that complexifies code but is absolutely necessary in all real applications, right? Um, so the more failure modes we introduce uh, that require renegotiation to get out of at a minimum and potentially where you can't even recover just based on that. Uh, we just need to give extra thought to how we can either avoid that or notify the, the application of what's happening. Yeah, that's why I didn't ask it before. It's, it's a very general question. His was a precise example of that. Yeah, I guess the case where the track change of isolation mode under your foot seems pretty tricky for a developer. Like, you know, I, I start showing these great Canvas demos that I'm streaming over my peer connection. I'm so proud. And suddenly, this is sending black and sending a regulation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and right, you use yeah, and the, you, you know, the conceptual model to understand what's happening is pretty. Uh, this, this smells so, like something that uh, error reporting. Yeah, so I guess at least having an event that your track is, you know, becoming isolated would be pretty useful. Yep. Yeah, I, I agree. It would be useful to have some kind of error reporting here. But I mean, that, that I will say, that said, you really can't get in this situation accidentally. I mean, you have to, like, you have to activate this feature deliberately and, like, like, like you can't get it. I mean, it's like, it's not like, you know, this is clearly an advanced feature. And if you're going to use this feature, you need to be a little attentive to what you're doing. Uh, I should hope so. Yeah. And I mean, and, and by the way, I mean, no, and, and none of these, and by the way, none of these things, I mean, all these things, by the way, will fail, like, it will, you know, it will fail before we negotiate. I guess you know, the local display will work. So, um, yeah. So, uh, I thought you were saying that there, there are cases where you can get a redirect on a video stream that you didn't cause. It was caused by the remote side. You didn't, you didn't do this at all. You had nothing to do with it. And all of a sudden, you have an isolated stream. Oh, sure. I agree with that. But I mean, like, every WebRC demo I've ever seen, like, well, modulo, like, like two is like you know two people on the same website, at which point it's clearly the fault of the guy with the website. And the only only way you can get that, that that remote setting right is if you have basically a federated system to start with. No, if you start with uh, you know non-isolated peer connections through which you stream your video stream with capture stream, and suddenly the you know MPEG dash points you to a new origin, suddenly your stream becomes isolated and your demo just fails for no reason you can possibly understand. So, so Dom's talking not about cameras now, but but about I want to send someone else the video that I'm watching. I, I don't know why you wouldn't send them the URL and let them download it well, themselves. But Well, um, uh, let, let's take the Canvas example then. You know, you're, you're doing something, you're using an interactive Canvas that does something and you want to yes. stream it to your peer. Well, except if you I'm start. Isolated. So, so the, the way Canvas works is that if you put any cross-origin content on them, they become dirty, and you can't. No, no, I, I, I understand that, but we but I thought we'd agreed that isolation was not intended to enforce, was not intended to, to transit peer, to transit peer connections. I mean, like I would assume if you have a Canvas like that, like you won't be able to scrape into the peer connection at all. This, this, yeah. this mechanism or not. I mean, yeah, ignore, I mean have, take this entire mechanism out of the equation. If you if you have a mixed canvas that you're, you're if you have a canvas is local and you're streaming out and you add cross origin, it'll stop working entirely. 
without this mechanism in play. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, you could use it to bypass to bypass the emergent protection on campuses. Sure. So, so the, 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 I mean, the basic the basic black, the basic invariant point. of the basic invariant of a um a, 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 of origin isolation in in canvases, as Martin says, is that if I have a canvas which is instantiated by JavaScript context A, and I'm mixing content JavaScript context B, context B, like I can no I can no longer inspect it from A, right? That's the whole point. And so that 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 has to extend to the, that has to be has to continue to be the case whether you're, when you're streaming it out via peer connection, whether this mechanism is in play or not, because otherwise, uh, otherwise the um, situation would be you could use a peer connection to bypass same origin protections. And so that's what Martin was saying yesterday, which is that even if you have um, that, that we don't attempt to extend the origin boundary path through the peer connection there aside. Um, so like the, 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 this mechanism is a side is a side is a side note. Um, this mechanism simply doesn't, it doesn't allow it. It doesn't, it doesn't make it any worse. But that, that, that's, that's in the, well, I mean, but, in, but, in, but in this, but in, in the case we're talking about here, where you have that mixed situation, no possible JavaScript incantations will cause the data to be sent over the other side right. under any conditions. Like, like, you, you screwed it up. You screwed it up, bad. and you can't fix it. It cannot be fixed. Um, and that's true. And that's true. So and that's true even with no, well. that's true even with none, even with no code. Even with no isolation properties at all. Right. I, I guess the only thing I was saying is that stuff can happen. So getting notified of it, right. and you know, it's not a super complicated example. It's not something you could get into this without realizing. And if you don't get any notifications, then you're absolutely. In so yeah. What, I guess what I would say, what I would suggest would be that if you have that, that I think going back to Martin's presentation yesterday, um, if you attempt to add, if you attempt to attach, um. You know, it, it, if you attempt to attach something to a, to a peer connection that can under no circumstances be rectified, it would be useful if you were told that. Yeah. So, like, if you attempt to add a cross-origin um, video to a peer connection, then that should generate some kind of some kind of say, some kind of error or warning. Um, and I mean, arguably, uh, uh, no, um, arguably it shouldn't be. Uh, arguably, it should be like an exception. <laughs> um, but at least it should do something. Yeah, I, I think the idea of a, an on error. Or something along those lines oh, would yeah, be fine. Yeah. So you just said for the case where you add a cross-origin content of some sort, right? I understand that. So the, I, I, think I think the question I was trying to get is cross-origin as well is an, is another is is basically the same thing. Exactly. That's what I was asking about. Is is something that becomes cross-origin not because you have just now added it your application? I mean, you added something that wasn't cross-origin, and it just sort of became that way through an action that you didn't take as a developer. Um, yeah. No, no, that, 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 it's, it's always your fault. All right, that's all I have anyway. Does any, anyone else want to find more holes to pick chewing gum in? Uh, I, yeah. I had a question about the it's always your fault. Uh, is that somebody's ahead of me? Um, well, I mean, no. I, I wasn't talking about you, Jonathan. Okay, no. Uh, Okay. No, it's okay. It's always your fault. Uh, so uh, that's true. So uh, I, will, I mean, if you've got two peer connections and you're feeding the output of one into the input of the other, and the other guy decides to go isolated, then your the one you're feeding in will also have to go isolated. So is that my fault? Yes. Yeah. Let's not let's not litigate this too much. But yes, you are responsible for that. Uh, 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 that runs in the browser. Okay, I am I am happy to be responsible for it if I can know it happened. Right, so that's what we're talking about now, and I think this is okay. A perfectly reasonable. Okay, so is there a way? I mean, so maybe there's a way that I need to even before the on error for me to monitor. Hey, this this thing, whatever it is, just became isolated or mixed or dirty or whatever. Yeah, I so that, do, that's I better check. Do it my own media stream. Mm -hmm. Uh, should you Microsoft a uh, question on the uh, user uh, use case uh, do you expect any uh, use case that uh, we will allow kind of recording on one side but not in on the other side no okay right no, not anyway, really not make sure you, you know we all think through that yeah. all right so um, do we want to explore the idea of putting some information on media stream which was 
something that I kind of wanted to avoid, but um, sounds like we have some people basically arguing for that. Do we want to know when the media stream is cross origin? In, it, it, just in general, period. So DOM media stream, you know, the, the whole, the DOM object media stream would get a new attribute that says, or tracks, actually, probably more than streams, tracks, um, would, would get a property that basically says, you can't touch me. So uh, there are Ooh, two Ooh, yeah, scenes. the MC Hammer one. Uh, yeah. And there are, so the potential isolated property that says you can or cannot touch me, and there is also whether a given track can become isolated. Like yeah, so you would need an event potentially as well that says so in any case, or In something. any case, you need uh, an event, but there are some tracks that cannot become isolated once you've gotten, uh, I think so at least, once you've gotten a camera stream once you're transmitting on a non-P identity peer connection, that one cannot change and become isolated, or can it? No, I, I'm not aware of any way that we can isolate a, 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 a gum stream that's been granted. So, and that means as a developer, you don't have to care about the Correct. unisolated events. Yep. But there are many other cases where you have to care about them, and it would be nice if you could detect it in advance. Basically. Detect in advance is not something that we can ever do, because we don't know what Right. But no right. event causes that, but most of those things are directly in, initiated by the JavaScript application themselves. Right. So, the, the, so the, the 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 technical consensus here, right, is that um, is that gum can't gum streams cannot become isolated once they're not cross origin once they're not, but the like canvas media stream create for create until ended it can, right? Yes. And I mean, I think you're probably right that it can't be. You're probably right that there's no way to do it, have that happen by accident, but it does seem like I bet it happens a lot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. I also, I mean, is there some way, is there some corsy way to get cross origin access to um, to, to uh, video tags? Yes. Video tags. Yeah. So definitely. that seems like something. So that seems like something could happen. So now, oh, but now, now it can happen, right? Because now, now the way to think about this you is you dash it up, and, and you you don't get the cause headers, or you do get the cause headers, and they go back and forth. There's a back and forth because because say um, because they say you have like you have content from two different places. Um, so if if that can happen, then it seems yeah. like it happened by accident. And you should get an, an indicator. Yeah. So yeah. as soon as under the control of the other guy, then you can be screwed up, right? So th this this hasn't been a problem previously because the media streams that you get aren't really much good for anything. Yeah. Um, but now we're actually making them useful for something. Um, we should probably actually start exposing these properties. And I think an isolated true or false and an on isolation change event is enough, sufficient. And I'll propose that I'll send text and I'll put it in the WebRTC spec because I think that's, that might be the right place, but maybe that's something the chairs and editors of the various specs can decide on. Because it doesn't make much sense in GUM, right? Unless we do the capture stream until ended stuff, and I don't think we're going to go there. And we've got a big section on stream isolation in, in WebRTC now, so let's go that. Uh, another question: Has this any connection with the encrypted media extensions? Ah, uh, DRM. No, this is not a DRM um, feature. We we hate DRM. I, you're, you're supporting it. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. Um, so, uh, I, the I way that these, these relate, I the guess. way that these relate is that uh, a media stream that is basically an EME media stream. The only way I can imagine getting one of those is, is you've got an EME stream being played out of video tag with all the, yeah, the associated yeah. stuff. If you did a capture stream on one of those, you would get a media stream, but the only thing you could do with it is render it to the screen probably following all of the same CDM nonsense that yeah. you have to do to, to render a, a DRM video anyway. That's the only relationship this has. So DRM content would be isolated, period. I don't, th I don't think there's any, anything more to it than just saying that it's isolated. 
So um, I think I know how this works, but could you just sort of reconcile, reconcile the two statements that a essentially a gum obtained track cannot become isolated, um, and yet essentially any track of any stream can become isolated because it can be tainted by other okay. isolated. The, the general tracks. principle is that tracks can change their isolation state at any time. Specifically for gum, however, if it's not isolated, it will remain so. Um, there's some interesting corner case that um, I, I've written up in the in the spec regarding um, tracks, but that's the only other um, RTCP connection. So uh, I guess my earlier point was it would be nice if you could know that yeah. a gum tract can that a given track cannot change its isolation because cannot it has, change. It's a you know. Do you want us to make promises? Sorry? Do you want I mean, us to make a promise? Like, if you know it comes from gum, you know that it cannot change its isolation. Uh, I think we can make that promise in the spec rather than in, in code. So someone knowing that they acquired this from gum, would, they would, that would be their indication that they didn't have to monitor for the event and pay attention to the properties. But that, that's assuming you can always determine this from the application layer. Oh, sure. If, if you're operating something that doesn't pull from gum, then you have to assume that the properties can change, and you know, too bad. That's that's just a that's just something you might have hey, to. Hey, I'm with. getting a media stream through a peer connection, which was coming from another peer connection, and so on. I mean, at yeah, some point, yeah. it would be nice if I could determine whether I need to deal with uh, isolation change or not. I think the implication is based on the discussion here that if it comes from peer connection, it can change, and there's. We, we don't want to start discussing having the fact that it's come from gum on this side being invariant because I think that introduces more signaling load on us. Okay, so it means that technology. any basic peer connection manipulation of media stream needs to react on isolation change, right? Well, you could do the silly thing and not do that, but I don't. Yeah. <coughs> All right. Topics exhausted. So, um, action is to look at surfacing some property properties on media streams tracks that will allow you to learn about whether they're isolated or not. Learn when it changes specifically. Yeah, <clears throat> and and to prove me wrong when I'm, I worry about the schedule for this. But, uh, <coughs> Oh, um, maybe not this afternoon, but soon after. Great. I'll see what I can do. Depends on how much I have to get up and use the microphone. Bernard's behind you, by the way. Which is, I, I do some, think some of these things could create weird effects, like in peer-to-peer -peer networks, where you're sending a track to like four people, and then like one of them becomes a request isolation, and now like it, it could get pretty strange among the among the peer mesh. Uh, if you've got a fully meshed network and and you, you you're requesting isolation and there's strings bouncing around, they'll taint everything. Yeah, that's what I'm uh, saying. It's like but one yeah. guy wants isolation and the others don't, and you know now I think that's you have to turn it on and it affects the other people and so. That's that's a failure mode you're gonna have right, to deal am with. Am I wrong? I don't think it's going to be as much of an issue because they'll be in different peer connections. So though the one guy who turned it on, his peer connection became isolated. Um, it's not. But the, the, but only only if only if your system is instead like let's say um, I'm in a conference with you and Gary. Okay. If I'm sending my media to Gary and to you, I don't see a problem. If I send my media to you and then you send it to Gary and uh, off to someone else, yeah, then I think we got a problem. But that's a pretty weird. Like, what if what if I requested isolation with you, that got turned that on, and then but these two guys didn't? Wouldn't that? I'm, I'm trying to get it. It's a property of the track now, and you're sending that same track to someone else, and now he has to. Turn on isolation as well. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So it trickles. So basically, property. everyone kind of has to. Yeah. Okay. So if I had cloned the tracks before I sent them to the two different people, then they would be 
different, right? The different tracks, yes. Yeah, and and we wouldn't have that problem. So that would it's sort of an advanced workaround, but clone the isolation property isn't doesn't go to the clone. No, the the clone. Uh, sorry, clones. When you when you clone a, 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 a an isolated track, you get an isolated track. But but if uh, but if you so clone an unisolated track, you just get the. You get okay, so I clone track. it first. And then these 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 clones, some are isolated and some are not isolated. Is that right? You got to start drug free and then make sure you don't share needles, okay? So and the clone is sort of the barrier for not sharing the needles. And we, we can get this. I, 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 there's a case where it can fail, but I think we can write applications where it works. I, I this is Ted Hardy who hates that metaphor. Um, <laughs> Please never use that <laughs> metaphor in relation to this or anything else again. <laughs> Thank you for playing. Second. Uh, no, I'm, I, uh, his basic point is is correct though, right? You you could design an application where you'd intended to do some form of application layer multicast or something, and the result of somebody asking for isolation in the context of that application would be you taint everything and you'd be required to be isolating everything downstream of the emitter, right? But that's a consequence of the design of the application, and you can certainly design applications which don't have that property. Yes. Yeah, right. So in the full mesh case, um, definitely you can do that. If you're doing a lot of relaying, and that's why you wanted your peer-to-peer -peer network, then you may not be able to get around those problems. Keep, keep in mind that if you want isolation in a, in, a, in a relaying scenario, the first guy that receives your isolated media is the only one that can render it. He's not going to be able to pass it to anyone else. So full mesh is okay, and and hop by hop relayed with security doesn't work because it's hop by hop. So that's a good, it's a feature, not a bug. But, but that assumes a P identity case, right? But well, really other way, that's the only way you can get isolated media to someone else with actual content in the stream. If it's isolated, it's isolated. You get black. Yeah, but I guess, and I don't have the full picture yet, but. Say I'm not transmitting camera streams, but again I'm transmitting whatever you know, creative, canvas, interactive stuff we are doing uh, uh, as a mesh system. And suddenly one of the users of the network starts, you know, adding a, a kitten in the canvas from a non-cross-origin non authorized source. Will that tank everything? It'll tank that stream and everything that that stream shares a peer connection with. Yes, but at the point that they put a, the kitten in the canvas, poor kitten, um, the app is no longer able to access that canvas. They can't send the canvas. Yeah, but I, I, I'm talking about different I, things I, I, here. So not sending is one thing. Tanking everything is another thing, right? So letting it possible, making it impossible for the developer to say, okay, I'll just send black because I can't send anything is quite different from, oh, and by the way, this kitten just crashed your application. I and mean, I guess if there was a way for the application to decide whether you'd rather, you know, yeah. start the full tainting stream or just, you know, send black, I mean, uh, so let's say that you have this extremely strange use case where what, what I want to do is to be able to send a kitten to you, but to tell you you cannot send the kitten on. DRM. Right. right. Well, so you know that that's what I'm going to do. You're going to get the kitten, but you can't send the kitten on to any of other our collaborators in 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 this system. Um, so I'm I'm painting the kitten onto the the collaborative can canvas, but I'm sending it to you, and you can't send it on to anybody else. In order to make sure it doesn't tank in er everything else, I have to put it in a separate peer connection. That's all we have to do. That's it. Yeah, that's all I have to do. At that point, you get it. You can't send it on, but it hasn't affected anything else in the peer connection because it didn't cause them to be isolated. Right? It's when I put it into something. A, a track is going into. A peer connection, it causes isolation for everything in that peer connection. Yeah, on the remote so side, yeah. If I want to make sure that the rest of the things I was sending you are not isolated, I have to maintain that separation between the peer connections of the isolated track and the peer connections of the others. Otherwise, if what I really meant was, hey, I'm now adding an isolated thing to this peer connection, and I don't want you to send anything on anymore, then I can add it to the existing peer connection with the on negotiation step. And then from that point on, you can't use my uh, any track from that peer connection to send on to anybody else. Clara? Right. 
clarinet? So I mean, I, I probably need to look more into this. My fear, and it might be a misplaced one, is that it's not that you're trying to protect whatever, whatever is happening in this canvas. You are actually happy to share as much as is shareable through the cross-origin policy. And it just happens that one of the users decides to put a kitten that happens not to have a course header, which wouldn't be so surprising. And then suddenly everything crash. And you know, how would I, as as an app developer, making sure that this would not let everything crash, but just say, okay, you know, what I would be transmitting is black because for you know technical reasons beyond your understanding, this is not something I can share through this peer connection. But you know, black is better than just crashing the whole interactive experience I was building. So this is where we're talking about the on error message that we're on error event on peer connection basically says you're now sending black for this stream. I think that's perfectly perfectly workable and that can be tied into the um, the isolation property on that on that stream. If so isolated, there is sending black. So an announcement to the line to the queue is cut now. I think we have Dan and uh, one more uh, clarification, uh, clarification question uh, on the truck isolation property. Do you expect to uh, you are able to change a uh, truck from isolated to not isolated? There are cases in the dash scenario that we were talking about where that happens. Okay, so basically happen. on the receiver side, if I receive a stream which is isolated, I can change that to unisolated. It seems to me a bit defeat the purpose of. No, that. no, you, you won't be able to change that at the application level. That's an invariant. That's uh -huh. a property of the stream that effectively read only. But in in the case where in the case where you have a peer connection, streams are being marked yeah. isolated. Every time that, that you want to change from isolated to non-isolated because the original source stream is changing between isolated and non-isolated, then you'll have to switch this, switch the um, do a renegotiation effectively. U T D T L S connection, and then you'll get you know the whole application lifecycle. This is this is crazy, not interesting as far as I'm concerned, but. So this is a kind of internal property kind of controlled by the user agent in a right. way. To the, the user agent says, right. I'm protecting this stream. Can't yeah, touch right, it. Got it. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. You won't be able to change that. So to go back to Colin's analogy that Ted hated. Um, yeah, don't. <laughs> um, actually, I think it's quite relevant here, right? Which is that. No. <laughs> uh, that you can't avoid being tainted. The point is that you don't know in advance whether anything you get from a peer connection can become tainted at some point down the road. So after you've made the decision to use it. So the workaround is to use another peer connection. If you don't want any particular thing you receive over a peer connection to possibly affect, not, not just that, I understand that may be tainted, but the issue is that that may taint everything else that you send on beyond that. So if you don't want that to happen, you just use another peer connection. Uh, so yes, um, I think that's pretty straightforward. When you actually get down to the to brass tacks on this one, this is not actually a problem. So I, I know plenty of people at WebRTC conferences who talk about ways to relay media for yeah. whom this may become a problem. So that's that's why I'm asking. Cues cut. Great. Cut. Yes. So <clears throat> I think I know what to do. Um, yeah, you have a lot to do, and um, we need a lot quick, to do. quick deliveries, I think. Well, sound like a lot to me, but maybe I'm wrong. But um, for us here now, I think it's time for coffee. So let's have a break until quarter past three.
<laughs> yeah. Okay, time to get started again. Alex, please come up.
You still need a scribe, though. Mm -hmm. It's okay like that? Yeah, I think so. <coughs> that projector is not friendly. No. No. Okay. Looks like uh, the crackers have more appeal to the yeah. audience than the interoperability problems, yeah. surprisingly. Like, what, makes, in the what, what makes me sad is that constraint had more appeal than that, and that's, that's, that's not a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> You don't want to be remembered the one that had less audience that one strength, right? It's pretty bad. I think that's not bad. Constraint has the biggest audience. Because it's controversial. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I think you can get started. All right. Uh, I'll... All right, so the scope of the next 30 minutes is to try to go through some of the interoperability problems caused by deficiency in the specs and not a problem or a difference in the implementation. All right, so I went through, I went through the, the mailing list and some of the bugs, and I picked the one I think not only are important and can be solved uh, quickly within the 30 minutes here. Next slide. Uh, there's quite a few bugs in data channel still. There, the bug open about the data channel label. Uh, it looks like there is a discrepancy between the W3C and the IETF uh, specs on that. The W3C implying that the label should be unique, while IETF uh, saying that only the ID should be unique for the data channel. I think it's, it's quite an easy one. There is an ongoing discussion on the mailing list on that, but it hasn't been closed yet. Uh, it looks like the consensus is almost there, as the label should not be unique. And there is already a process for raising an error when you try to use a label that has already been used by the, another data channel. ID, ID, yeah, syntax error or something like that. Uh, so unless, unless there is a, a strong opposition, I suggest that we follow what there is on the mailing list, and we update the W3C spec to be in par with the IETF and explicitly states that uh, the label don't have to be unique. I, I agree as author of the IETF specs. All right. Um, then there are a lot of arguments that are being passed to the constructor of the data channels. Uh, some are related to RTP, some are related to S, uh, SCTP. It's, uh, it's a little bit of a mess right now. Uh, some are mutually exclusive, some not. Uh, that, in that case, there is an error that can be raised, so we can we can catch that, but the error text can be improved. And one thing that I've been uh, singled out on the mailing list as not being addressed is when some fields are being too long or too large, depending if it's a string or an integer. Some specs say that it should be 6,535 bytes. Some specs say it should be 65,534. Uh, we need to we need to take a decision on that and, and put it explicitly in the specs because right now we're kind of in between. I don't know if people have strong feelings about that. And uh, the other question altogether is: Do we deprecate completely RTP? Right. Um, and I don't know the state of the specs regarding to that. The RTP was never in the spec, right? I will not quote you. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what was that exactly? Let me write it down. No, so um, practically speaking, there is still a lot of arguments around and a uh, special key to pass to the constructor as a JSON object that are making things complicated for people that actually want to implement and support Chrome 32 to 35 and Firefox, the latest version. Um, what's the plan? Yeah, so uh, Chrome prior to 34 and like is dead, and so it's like not just dead to me. Like there are probably like eight users um, 
all like who don't even have internet access to the outside world. So you know, basically, the the RTP stuff is is, is like I, I don't understand why this going forward would be like a, a complexity issue. That you know, it's a historical issue until we had the SCTP stuff. The SCTP stuff is actually quite stable uh, at this point, and so we have basically informed uh, you know the community that we're going to be you know getting rid of the RTP stuff imminently. All right, so that. That takes the deprecation problem out of the table. What about explicitly putting in the, in the specs the, what is the maximum length uh, of the object of all the field that are in the in the dictionary used in, in, in the constructor? I think that's a good idea, but that doesn't strike me as something that is actually a real world interoperability problem. <laughs> Well, let's say you use for the label a string that is too long, it's crashing in your face Six, without many over sixty-five k. <laughs> don't don't assume anything about the I, user. <laughs> I mean, I I'm just kind of curious to get some real-world feedback of you know are people like hitting that and and if so, like what are people using this field for that maybe we had not contemplated? Okay, I'm going to give you a use case. Okay. Um, the biggest financial <laughs> biggest financial institution forty thousand. Uh, transaction a second. They want to use the data channel. They automate the name of the label by concatenating, and they reach that limit. I think maybe if they're hitting that limit, they should re they should redesign it because even if, what, no matter whether it's 65, 534, or 535, there's a limit. And if if their process produces something that's unbounded, it won't fit. They should put that in another data channel. No, no, I, I do agree with that. I do agree with that, but uh, the limit was not explicit in the document, so... Okay, that, that that's, was, I mean, that's so. fascinating, you know. I would say, you know, cut it off at 65,000 and call it a day, but um, okay. that's, that's very interesting. All right. Um, there's still a lot of question about how to use the sending buffer and where we want the, the data channel to be closer to WebSocket, that was the original intent, or to other stream model uh, that have a feedback, a callback when uh, uh, the buffer is available to send another object. That's a question that was raised two or three times, uh, at least on the mailing list. Uh, I don't know where, where we are on the decision. It's not a spec question per se, but... So I've heard this come up on our list, and the answer has been, use the new W3C streams API, which kind of deals with this problem. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's our W3C position for that? that that's, what I, that's what I've heard other people you know, say, that basically there is no you know, uh, buffer dry event. Um, so you know, basically you can watch buffer amount and kind of pace it based on that. But uh, I think if you want to deal with this in, a, in any sort of fire and forget fashion, streams might be a good choice. So noting, of course, that streams does not exist. Every time, every time someone suggests it, it turns turns out to be a different document. <laughs> right, the the one I, I I recall being mentioned was not the the W3C stream was another one, Node stream or Python stream and so like that. And they were providing two just two additional feedback. So the, the question is, do we want to keep the data channel API the way it is, or do we want to add that one or two additional feedback to, because people are going to implement, if only for file transfer, something a little just, you know, at the application level. Do we want to make their life easy, or? My take is that this isn't the biggest issue with file transfer, and that streams would solve, when it's done, would solve this and the actual big issue, which is that you get a giant blob in memory at the receiver side. All right, so, so if I understand you correctly, one stream will be done, you would be in favor of switching? I'm not sure it's a switch, I think it's incremental functionality. All right, fair enough. Uh, next slide. Um, just a question for the people that implement, when we provide a stern server, in the application, we have to provide a different one for Google and Mozilla. I cannot use the Google provided one with Firefox. I think that that's historical. Is, okay. like, I bet that's still, it might still be some code in AppRTC that does this. I can go rip it out right now. If... So it's currently, that should not be needed anymore.
Okay, I tested one month ago and it wouldn't go through. I will retest. Um, that was the current one month ago. I cannot tell you the exact number, but I will do it thoroughly and, and communicate with you guys. So this is uh, so the, for the, those who can't hear Ecker, this seems to be an implementation bug, and bugs should be filed, filed on implementation. It should not be true. <laughs> and, and by the way, we did fix our stun server finally to do the right thing regarding the XOR address, so there's no reason. My, my guess is what happened here is that there's a code in AppRTC that looks at the user agent and sends in a different stun server, and people probably copied that like all over the interwebs. Yeah. I'm going to check it now. Not just that. Yeah, it, it didn't. It didn't work like you know a month or two ago. Um, I had the same problem because, you know, you know, Alan and I have the book. Every time we put out a version of the book, we actually like just like try everything again with stuff like that, and yeah, a bunch of things were broken right in that moment. Okay. Well, I'll wait to hear back from Eric before I pull this code out then. Next slide. Um, this one was fantastic. I thought I should quote it. Uh, the status of trickle ass in, 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 in Firefox, it looks like this is still vague. So maybe this is a good time to address that vagueness. This is the issue we talked about yesterday about what about the um which uh which what stunt whether stunt candidates ought to appear in um uh order appear in sdp so first of all anyone first of all any code which expected stunt candidates not to appear in sdp is broken um now in the future like it may be able to rely on that but the spec the spec was not clear on this point at some point so um like in any case, um, as I remember, I'll go look at my notes from JSTEP, but as I remember, the current situation is that no is that no initial offer should contain some candidates. All right, so the, if, if I remember that thread, it was reported by Ibanez. The thread was like, on ice candidate was never fired uh, on Firefox. The first answer was, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Only the ice candidate that are available at the time you call create offer or create answer are within the SDP. Yeah, we spent possible. like 20 minutes on this yet, on, on, on Monday. Um, so the there's a candidate pool, and Firefox and Firefox currently populates the offer with anything that is with whatever's in the pool at the time, and then fires on as candidate afterwards. Um, per the discussion, as I recall, we'll have to go look up, look at the notes. Um, the Current proposed behavior is that the initial offer will contain no candidates, but then subsequent offers will contain will, may well contain candidates. Um, so, like I say, any code which basically assumes that like no candidates is like screwed up. Now, it may be the case, and I believe we do, Adam, we do properly file um, candidate null now, right? At the end. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Well. The thread is still open in the public so, mailing so, list. So, right? to summarize, the, to, so, so to summarize, I mean, like, yes, that was lacking the specs, and we think we've cleared it up in this meeting. I mean, it needs to be reflected into the specs, but we at least hope know which direction we're going. Perfect. Um, I'm not sure if there is a next slide, but just in case. Um, yeah, I think the. I'm not sure we, we closed the question of having a global stop on the media stream now that we have the media stream track and we have the stop on each of the track. So I'm kind of curious on exactly where we ended up here. I know that we decided that media stream track dot stop just stops the track as opposed to the source. Because I know we kind of like went back and forth on that. My understanding was we actually removed media stream dot stop because you could have, if you stopped the stream and then added a track to it, like what would that mean? So, is that the agreement? Am I understanding correct? That was the reason. That essentially, a you know, it can become. Um, I think it's disabled. We call it right, but then it can become enabled again if you add another, another track to it. Active. It's active and inactive. That's what it is. Yeah, right. some of the users were saying, well, now I have to physically go through all the tracks and stop them one at a time. Why couldn't we do a, a global stop method that just implement that loop? And so the reason is because what we have a state that is not defined. If we had a track after having stopping all, all of the other one. Well, it's because, you, yeah, you may actually want to put a track back into it. 
Right. A, a stream doesn't have any state attached to it. It just is a bag of tracks. And if the tracks are inconsistent in their state, like it's not clear what it means to stop a media stream. OK. All right, so we Randall, said you just showed up on screen. Were you going to ask or say something? I was going to say that the reason we had stop originally was because it was was because it was simpler to, as was mentioned here, to call stop and have it just simply iterate through all the tracks and stop them. Um, and not having it there is causing everyone, every single person to basically create a something that does that. If they, you know, and if they don't do that, there would be probably some cases where they miss something. And they had, you know, a, a track they didn't think of, they just stop sub zero or whatever. Um, I don't have a problem with having stop there, especially if it only if, if it's just a, a stand-in for, you know, everyone in the world generating their own version of it. But I'm also I don't you know they can also generate their own versions of it. Fine. Would there be anything any reason why we wouldn't provide uh, such such a convenience method? It, I wouldn't want to. I mean, if we did. And I'm not saying we should add it back in, but if we do, it should have a different name. It should be something like stop tracks. So again, it's clear you're not stopping the media stream. Oh, it's see. just a convenience method for stopping all of the tracks at once. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense to me. It, it doesn't seem like a high order bit, but sure. Because we are already providing the active inactive as a convenience for checking the state for all tracks. So. I don't have a strong wait, wait, opinion. I, I'm not sure what you're saying there. I mean, the uh, media stream active inactive. Uh, that's kind of a, a sort of a state or sort of a gathered state uh, for all the tracks. So that's a convenience thing we're already providing. But that, that's per track, right? No, active inactive is for a media stream, but it reflects the state of all tracks in the stream. So if all stream, all tracks in a stream are ended, the stream is considered inactive. Active. And if if you add another non-ended track to that stream, the then stream it will active become again. active again. So, so this I would say this is on the same level of convenience all right, stuff. So, yeah. So that's that's one way at the stream level to have an idea of the more or less the state, right? But uh, I think. One of the reasons why this question is popping up on the mailing list is because the, there was a stop method before that people used to use, and now they are a little bit confused by not having something or something equivalent. Uh, so I think that proposing a stop all tracks, something with a different name to show that there has been a difference, and, and documenting that people that were using stop before might be happy to use that now, or pointing to the uh, inactive uh, uh, flag uh, might, be, might be a good thing to do from the developer point of view. I don't know if that makes sense to put that in the specs, though. I actually think it's probably it doesn't make sense, especially because we're moving to add track for peer connection. I was going to say, yeah, we're we're changing the model anyway. Mm -hmm. They're going to be even more confused, I think, when that happens, and that's just the way it is, right? That we're we are shifting more and more away from stream. Mm -hmm. As a as a core concept, it, it does almost make me wish that stream was just like a container and could be you know iterated and didn't have like get audio tracks or get video tracks and was just like gave you back a track and a track at a dot type or something because then you could just do like four each type patterns to to deal with this stuff. That would be even better if the if that was unified with the data channel, right? Sorry, I I couldn't listen to two at once. No, I'm sorry. Let me repeat. I say that that would be great. I would I would love that to have a unified video and audio and that would be even better if I if the way we handle the data channel through through the stream was was the same as well. So right now I, you can it's difficult to uh, to get a data channel. You have to know the ID or the label before. Right? Some people have read that on the mailing list. Okay, I'm going to go. And the first step seems like like kind of an, an easy win. The second one. I'm not sure that like having it is a relationship, but if like or say a peer relationship between data channels and media stream tracks, you know, more thought is is needed there. But we we should take a uh, you know, Harold, it sounds like you have some opinions here. Uh, treating data channels as if they were tracks was discussed extensively at the time we added data channels and reject, ex explicitly rejected. 
I do not suggest that we revisit that debate. Yeah. Okay. But what, on, on the topic of the get audio tracks versus get video tracks, is there any reason why we couldn't just expose tracks and allow people to inspect? I mean, I, I, I've always wanted to at least have an accessor that gave you all the tracks. Maybe yeah, not the data, yeah, right. And I, I thought we'd agreed several times to do that, and the editors have just failed to put it in or something. And I, I don't know. That's a separate adding. That's a separate question from removing get video or get audio. But, but yeah, I agree. Yeah. It shouldn't be either or. It should be in addition. Uh, uh, if we do that, then uh, get audio and get video can be can be like two li two lines of JavaScript again. Uh, but uh, can you file a bug for, for adding that? Oh, if you can find the if you can find the bug again. <laughs> I guess. Adam, may I, I'm an observer in this group, by the way. So, I, but this is a media capture uh, issue. But yeah, me and Adam uh, talked about it, and Adam's considering it. You have get video tracks, get audio tracks, but that's. Not very future proof. So we, we I put in uh, the suggestion get get other tracks, I think is what I said. <laughs> okay, so the so the, the bug seems to have been filed, so we'll 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 deal with it. All right. Uh, okay, I, I have a comment. I think this also comes from originally you revoked all access to the camera and microphone when you did media stream dot stop. Well, that, that specific and, thread on the mailing list didn't address that, but... Okay. And that was a convenience method, but even if we added something like stop this media stream to the media stream now, it wouldn't revoke the access in case that, that, that those sources were serving other tracks. No, I agree. I mean, uh, the, the, the concept of moving everything to the tracks and make the media stream a, a pure container, uh, if we follow that, would... would uh, would ask us to remove all the possible method for media stream, right? When, when they empty or, or convenience. So that makes a lot of sense. All right, I guess the, that was the, the last question. By the way, this is the user point of view. So that includes the implementation, but this is, uh, this is the way developers and users see, the, see WebRTC today. So uh, I've had a number of conversations with people who built this, and I don't know why they can't get it right. Um, but like this is wrong. For instance, Firefox 29 has turn. <laughs> so uh -huh. you, you can disagree with it, and I disagree with maybe half of it. But just you know, just for info. Just What's the point you were disagreeing with? I'm saying Firefox 29 has turn, and it's marked as yellow. Does it have turn TLS and turn TCP? No, so maybe that's it. Yeah, it, probably. Part of the problem with this is like, yeah. yeah. Well, if you click on the... They're quantized fairly grossly. Fairly grossly and not always <laughs> accurate, but yes. Um, um, why does Opera 20 have... How can Opera 20 have... Okay. It's based on Chromium, so... Okay, it's basically Chromium. Okay. All right, well, whatever. I, I've seen this diagram before. And it, it sometimes is right and sometimes is wrong. Okay. Right. More of a guideline than a... <laughs> actual, actual code. Yeah. Sure. Uh, it's the capacity to relay a remote stream to another remote. The, 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 take an output media stream track and jam it back in. I must say, I'm surprised we have it in yellow. Oh, we have it in red and yellow. It doesn't really work well in Chrome. It doesn't work well in Firefox. It only works in video in Chrome. So for like, you know, ASL, you're, you're, you're set. But. I, I'm pretty sure I've had it work in Firefox, but I don't know how well it works. <laughs> by, by the way, what's the status of the audio relaying in, uh, in, in Chrome right now? I would have to go check the bug. Uh, we're replumbing the entire audio stack so that we get like yeah. full browser echo cancellation. And once we have that working, um, I think we should be able to do the rebroadcast. We spoke with Xi'an or whatever the Xi Jing? Yeah. He's, he told us he's percolating all the way up to Chromium and back. And yeah, we're, 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 we're doing our once a year rewrite of the entire like code base, so yeah. So you won't, you won't yeah. risk a guess at the, at the timeline? Second half this year. 
Yeah, we recently uh, uh, um, uh, did uh, made a full browser uh, echo cancellation uh, active, uh, and I believe that's now in Aurora. <coughs> uh, so, um, and I think audio relaying should work. So you will uh, echo cancel like the output of like video tags and that sort of stuff. Um, I don't know. Video tags may bypass it for the moment, but a full mesh conference in WebRTC, uh, all, everyone should get canceled against everyone else instead of just canceling the single peer connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, when I was talking about full browser echo cancellation, I mean like all sounds coming out of the browser get echo canceled. Um, anything going through media stream. Including beeps. <laughs> yeah, anything going through media streams does. Uh, and I and uh, right and I and, and uh, I, I have to check on whether or not the, the you know, video tag is going through there yet or not. But, a MIDI element. Yeah, MIDI element. It should. It will. But and we're in the middle of a once yearly rewrite of that too. That's gonna be the excuse. <laughs> For what it's worth, um, I, I just tried and I, I didn't make a call because it was too much trouble. But like, as far as I can tell, like Firefox like 32 will correctly do is done. I, I thought all previous versions did too. I don't remember changing this code in a long time, but like I'm too lazy to download Firefox 29. But like, wait, use, sorry, using Google, yeah. Okay. I guess I'll download 29 and see if it works. All right. Oh, just stop present present presentation. So oh, this one has to be turned on. I feel so self-conscious looking at that picture. <laughs> yeah, that might actually work. Hey, I see you all. The remote people can see you. Yeah, so this is the summary and the conclusions for WebRTC. And uh, might throw in media capture too. So for media capture, I got the feeling that we're getting close. Not with the cigar, but uh, getting close. And uh, we seem to have uh, have had some meeting of minds. I won't say solutions, but meeting of minds on the pesky constraints thing. Which may be a time well spent if we actually manage to finish that one, put it to bed. And on uh, the WebRTC side, we have a couple of big items that are rolling in. One is doohickeys, and the other one is the integration of isolation in all these forms. And most of it uh, seems to be fairly subtle, but uh, as with anything of this magnitude and number of implications, there are certain to be bugs. The nice thing about the uh, interoperability talk, thank you, Alex, uh, is that uh, we're at the level of where people expect interoperability and actually have some interoperability and just encounter some bugs. Just encounter some bugs. Well, we have plenty. Um, so I would say we're fairly happy. I think this, this meeting has been useful. We as W2C are a bit worried about uh, them over there in the ITF. 
finishing everything that's on their plate in, time, in a timely fashion. But so we'll certainly, so the W2C people will chase after the IDF people to actually finish their assigned tasks and uh, update, update their documents. In some cases, that will involve people sh chasing their own tails. So we'll get things done. So on media capture, we have the understandings from this meeting to integrate. And we have the bugs that have been filed against the document now to fix, resolve, or say, no, we really intended it that way. Go away. And I'm sure there will be many more emails on that. But uh, I see a, a W2C last call glimmering in the distance, perhaps even on this side of the summer. My official schedule is still, still June-ish. So that's not very far away, but still, we might make it. So now I would like to like to ask my audience, my compatriots, those people, uh, any closing last comments? Things that you think we could have done better? Things we need to take onto our action plans? Open mic session. What? Kumbaya. Um, what is, uh, there were a bunch of bugs filed, at least with respect to the media capture specification after Friday, where I know you went through and enumerated uh, what was filed until then. And even then, what you enumerated, we didn't, I don't know, we resolved everything, although we made good progress. What is the chair's plan? Are you guys going to plan to have like conference calls every two to three weeks from now to get that to, to get the remaining issues uh, finished? Because otherwise, our next face-to-face -face meeting is a TPAC. Uh, uh, the main working method will be mailing lists. Uh, we will undoubtedly call a tele teleconference in the not too distant future. Two weeks, three weeks sounds about right, and to discuss the items where it's obvious that uh, email is not not resolving it fast enough. So we will emit new versions of the document at the most rapid pace that we can deliver them at. But we, and, and we will try to resolve all the detail bugs and, hey, you got this reference wrong bugs expeditiously so that uh, we're not cluttering the mailing list or the people's minds about those little things. So, yes, we will, we will do teleconferences. We will definitely do a teleconference when the subject is, are we ready, if, uh, do we have consensus to send this for WTC last call? And I think there will be at least one before that. Uh, but, Attend to the mailing list. Attend to your bugs. Yeah, just, be very vigilant. Just for my benefit, I think it would be good if someone could volunteer to just scrape Bugzilla and say these are the things that have open action items associated with them or no current resolution plan. Now, there's a lot of things that are obviously on the editor's plates. There's a lot of bu bugs that are basically waiting on someone to effectively write up the proposal and, and run the discussion through. So those two classes of things I'm not worried about, but I would like to get a, a, a good handle on things that we haven't actually um, got any concrete plan to solve. Yes. Do we, do we have someone doing a triage exercise at this point? Yes. The chairs are trying to okay. keep that updated. We have a list that we haven't made public. And uh, one of the things that, to, that you should be looking for is having bugs assigned to you. Right. 
I, I mean, I, I mean, I, th I, th I think bugs have a better chance of being completed when we know who to, who to ping. No, it's not about pinging, it's about bludgeoning. <laughs> yeah. So, so how far away do we think we are from Bugzilla plus accumulated issue trackers being able to enumerate the entire amount of work that is needs to happen between here and being done? For, for me, the capture, I'm hoping that we're close. And for us in weeks, for uh, web, WebRTC, I'm afraid that we haven't gotten through uh, to the level where we can actually, actually say, OK, let's file all the bugs yet. I'm hoping that we will be there before 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 the end of July, perhaps after ITF, we should be able to say we know what the work is, or we are certain we know what the work is. We have the list. Uh, could the you know anyone in the working group, but just again, a working group, give us any feedback on whether they would you know rather see most of the energy put into finishing get user media or most of the energy into documenting you know all the things into both of these specs that we decide in this meeting or you know how, how should we prioritize is all i'm asking here between the finishing get user media between the two documents my personal feeling is like if we can finish one like that's better than having two half finished so Man, it feels good to finish one. <laughs> and, remem and remember that uh, W2C last call is not finishing. It's the end of the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I would favor putting some elbow grease into get user media. It really shouldn't be hanging around for a lot longer. But, but it, we, we, we didn't have the, an in-out discussion. So what what do we think needs to happen there? Do do we wait do we need to wait for us to sort of realize some things are dragging behind? I, I would have liked to sort of make sure we all are on the same uh, same page around scope going out of this meeting. So what I've been hearing is what feels like a statement that Simulcast is out, uh, and no, no, but for version one point zero. Uh, yep, what I'm in here, uh, and uh, the stuff that we have there, nobody's taken a really serious suggestion with, that we take anything out. Doohickeys are definitely in, and I don't see that much contention at the moment. I don't see strong pressures to cut pieces, and I don't see strong pressures to add pieces. Simulcast is kind of uh, the the stuff that uh, we should be cracking, get cracking at real soon for 1.1 or whatever. But uh, otherwise, I don't see the strong pressure. I just have a comment, which is, I would advise doing what Justin suggested within that scope. And if you finish it, you might be surprised at what you're able to do. And then you should do stuff with what's there and then decide what's missing. Because it might turn out that you don't have less missing than you think. As opposed to saying, I need to do a zillion things and then discovering they were actually covered by what Justin already proposed. We had a number of cases this, this meeting where people have said, oh, you can achieve that by the current spec if you just Think about it a little bit differently. The typical one is, oh, if you use two pair connections, you can get all these properties. So that's a kind of thinking I really like. Instead of adding new features, say, oh, if I put these features up, then things work for me. Uh, so one thing I'm going to ask for. So with regard to constraints, we've made really good progress. There's one item that, to me, looks like um, it needs more specification. And, and what I mean by specification is actually agreement. 
and that is on what ideal is supposed to mean. And I'm bringing that up only because when I've talked with a variety of different people, I think there are differing opinions on um, how predictable the uh, response from the user agent should be when you use ideal. So I don't, I don't really care since, as you know, you know, I don't like ideal that much. I don't know that I'll need it. Um, I think the world will use it. But if there are disagreements on how it should work, start figuring those out now because we can't really put it into the spec until we know how much explanation to give on how it should work. Agreed. The number of times when we, when uh, uh, Peter said uh, ideal without considering what it means at the moment was stunning. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It needs to be, uh, uh, how to put it, filed as a feature bug and seriously considered. Peter has a proposal for the, net, for, the, for the syntax stuff as the action item. And uh, yeah, so yeah. we'll see. Uh, the chairs will find someone to assign it to. Yeah. Right. All I was going to say is that the, Peter having an assignment to write up what we discussed, it is not reasonable to, to say that he is also responsible 100% for defining exactly how ideal works. I'm just, that is an important piece of it. Okay, all right. I just want to make sure that there is agreement about what goes in. Some people say least squares. Some people say this approximation. Some people say I don't care. Some people say I really care. I don't care what it is, but I need to know precisely what it is. So that's the kind of stuff that you know each person has in their own mind. Each person who likes ideal has an idea, an ideal in their mind for what <laughs> ideal will do. And I don't think those ideals agree. That's all I'm saying. Work it out. Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh I was basically looking for someone to assign this task to, I mean, start start defining that, come up with the first proposal on text. So, I mean, I, I was sort of curious about some of the big things that are, we, there's a bunch of stuff we talked about today that sort of feels like it's in, in making good progress. We have a decent idea how it's going to finish up. Uh, you know, there, there's a bunch of kind of crank turning that needs to happen, but Overall, it seems on a good path, but there's a bunch of other stuff that we've all talked about here, like screen sharing, um, uh, things like uh, you know rehydration, partial offers, simulcast, and it would be nice to sort of be able to agree on that. That is not part of 1.0, just so that we don't have to keep like you know, so just so we can enumerate really all the things that are still remaining. Yes, I mean re. Rehydration uh, and uh, uh, screencasting and simulcast and rollback. That was was also also one of the pieces. I think rollback is in. I, I I think we understand it. We just haven't written it up yet. Right. So I mean, what I would really like, like to be able to do would be to kind of you know somehow look through the bug tracker and see all the things that we talked about. You know, in a bug and, and understand what the current status is, and a bunch of things that say these are things we care about, but we are ex expli explicitly not dealing with them for 1.0. And like that, you know, everything that we've talked about should should end up in that bug tracker or in the spec. And you know, that gives us like the total view of things. Yep. So the chairs will attempt to make the bug tracker do that. And I think that will take next week. Fantastic. In, so will the, j just to be clear, like these non 1.0 items, will we sort of have bugs for them and just say label not 1.0 or something to that effect? Uh, I think there's a status called won't fix with substatus later. Great. What that, whatever is in the bug tracker that clearly identifies it as, we looked at it, it's, it's not going into the spec now. It's a, good, it's a good status to have. I don't want to invent new states. OK. So we have a plan. The chairs are going to have some, exten so, some extensive conversations about Bug Tracker. And uh, the editors are going to get together and 
Do some more editing. With that, I think, well, my head is blown. And I would just say, thank you all for coming. And thank you, Google. And we'll see you next time. So what would next time be? I think this was actually quite useful to have 24 hours of focused energy on this stuff. In the interest of finishing, uh, will we be open to doing another one of these between uh, IETF and uh, well, in, in, between the next two ITFs? Yeah. Yep. So having some, having having a get together before TPAC sounds sounds like a, a real good idea. Some somewhere between now and TPAC, probably after uh, Toronto. But uh, let's uh, consider what we do there. It uh, takes an enormous amount of time, energy, and sheer money to gather this many people for this many uh, this many days. It takes a lot of time and money to not finish. Yes. <laughs> so it's so that's that's the trade-off. So let's let's look at having a meeting before TPEC face-to-face -face meeting. And we will use the telephone whenever we feel like it. And with that, I'll say thank you very much for coming. It was a pleasure. Thanks, guys. I'm hanging up now. <laughs>